Oblivion is an amazing game. Despite some complaints I might have had about changes made to the series after Morrowind, I can still step back and recognize Oblivion to be a pretty incredible experience, especially the first time through it all those years ago. Though I played Morrowind and Skyrim both again in the last year or so, it's been a bit longer for Oblivion and I thought I would do something fun which came to be this project. Taking a character I've made through one particular quest tree, in this case that's going to be the Mage's Guild. This is probably the guild I remember the least about as far as the main guilds in Oblivion are concerned, and my most recent playthrough on Skyrim was as a pure mage, and as with Skyrim, I've never played a full on mage in Oblivion, so I thought this would be a great time to give it a try. Not only that, but Oblivion was the last time we saw the amazing Spellcrafter, so I can't wait to tinker around with that because it's always a blast in Morrowind. It's still regrettable that we can't get levitation or super jump spells to leap half the province in a single bound like we can in Morrowind, but I'd rather have a gutted version of the spell system than none at all like we ended up with in Skyrim. That said, let's get into the head of our character a little bit before we begin. So we'll be playing as Fargothina, an immediate descendant of THE Fargoth found in the tutorial town of Morrowind, Sadene. That's right, the fellow who had his ring stolen and was found to be stuffing his money into a hollow tree outside of town. Unfortunately, Fargoth owed the tax authorities a decent sum, and combined with his problem with alcohol, he decided to just grab his stash coin, skip town, and hopefully avoid the problem altogether to start anew. He decided to reconvene with his daughter, Fargothina, who had been living by herself on the mainland of Morrowind not far away in Old Ebonheart. She had been scraping by working in the local tavern while dreaming of learning magic. She studied in her off time and picked up a few tricks, but nothing too intricate. Once Fargoth came back to her, problems in tow, Fargothina had enough after a few years and realized again why she was living separately from the Elder Elf. So, about six years after Fargoth arrived, around the year 433 of the Third Era, Fargothina set off on a quest westward to enter the province of Cyrodiil in an attempt to join the Arcane University and learn the greater ways of magic in order to make something of herself and escape the life of a daydreaming barmaid. She had heard tell from the Isle of Vardenfell and the tavern of the great Nereverine, seemingly coming out of nowhere to amass great power and gathered that nothing at all made her so different from this Nereverine, which encouraged her all the more. Unfortunately, she had very little in terms of savings when she left Morrowind, and shortly upon crossing over the Cyrodiil border, she may have accidentally let a few items that didn't belong to her slip into her pocket, and shortly thereafter had a meeting with the nearby city guard of Chadenhall. Subsequently, she was placed into the Imperial Prison, but she decided to look on the brighter side of things. This saved her the remaining walk to the Imperial City, in which the Arcane University resides. It would just require a short stint in the pen. She seemed to recall her father, Fargoth, mentioning he was never quite able to get along with Imperial authorities either, so perhaps it runs in the blood. And this is where our tale begins. Welcome to Oblivion and the tale of Fargothina the Arcane. Fargothina hadn't spent many days in the cell before a curious encounter transpired. While being verbally berated by a dark elf across the way, some guards and a well-dressed man appeared and attempted to access the cell. After being commanded to remove herself from the door, they barged in and the well-dressed man revealed himself to be Uriel Septim, the Emperor of all Tamriel. He seemed to be familiar with Fargothina. You. I've seen you. Let me see your face. You are the one from my dreams. But unless he had been a patron at the Hole in the Wall Tavern she had been working at for years, she found this to be fairly unlikely. Regardless, she wasn't the sort to look a gift horse in the mouth and allowed him to carry on about the stars and his dreams if it meant she was earning a quicker ticket out of the prison system to get on with her dreams. Fair enough. As she followed the Emperor and his blades through the convoluted underground system that connected to her cell, she came to realize that perhaps the fellow wasn't completely mad as assassins seemed to appear from nowhere and begin attacking. Helping herself to some of their goods, she continued on with the team until they locked the doors behind them, insisting that she stay. 
Fortunately, a rat with the strength of Nerevar himself takes this opportunity to bust through a crumbling wall, allowing her access to continue on away from the prison. After making her way through some twists and turns, she reconvened with the group, at which point the Emperor insisted that Fargathina be allowed to accompany them, and the Blades grudgingly complied, though they did mention they would keep their eyes on the prisoner. A few short rooms later, it appeared as though the group had wandered into a trap, and Fargathina was told to keep the Emperor safe in a small chamber, at which point he turned to her and shoved a precious-looking amulet into her hands, suggesting that at all costs it must be kept from the assassins. He seemed convinced that his time was near and only moments later was proven correct, though at this point, with all of the harassment, it's hard to consider that much of a prophetic statement. After the Emperor was stricken down, the remaining blade came to speak with Fargathina, asking after the amulet and seeming to accept that it was given to her in his last moments. He suggested that she make her way to Wayne and Priory in order to meet a Joffrey character and provided a key to access the deeper tunnels of the sewers, which would eventually lead to sweet freedom. Accepting the key, but not necessarily the recommendation of a travel destination, Fargathina fought her way through the remaining rats, blocking her way to freedom. Immediately after breathing in the first gasp of fresh air after escaping the prison, Fargathina decides to continue on her quest. That Emperor was mighty insistent upon her delivering the amulet, but the most important thing seemed to be to keep it away from the assassins, and what safer place than with her, after all? On the way to the university, Fargathina sells a few things in the market quarter which she acquired in the sewers before continuing on. Heading to the university in the Imperial City, she was immediately rejected and informed that she, in fact, had to visit each and every guild in the province and receive a recommendation before she would be admitted. Unfortunately, living in the quiet corners of Morrowind means one doesn't necessarily get all the news. Apparently just two years prior, the Archmage Hannibal Traven altered the Mage Guild Charter to include a requirement for all new candidates for membership needing to visit and gain acceptance from all the Guildhall stewards in the land of Cyrodiil. Troublesome for sure, but at least she would have a chance to hone some of her skills and see the sights of Cyrodiil proper, perhaps even make a few friends along the way. That in mind, she set off to the town of Chadenhall, as that was the closest to the Imperial City geographically. Along the way, Fargathina encountered a couple of bandits, but otherwise it was an idyllic walk, picking up mushrooms and other flora on the way. Upon arrival in front of the daunting city walls, Fargathina meets a nice Dunmer indicating she can buy a horse from the stables, but Fargathina passes on that as she is certain it is well beyond her current financial means, and heads into the town gates. The first stop is to see Borba's goods and stores to offload the miscellaneous items she's collected along the way to fatten her pockets in an attempt to save up for the future spell acquisition as those can be quite pricey. At this rate, Fargathena will be lucky to be able to afford one or two lower level spells to even out the range. Exiting the shop and meandering around Chadenhall in search of the guild, she eventually finds it without having to ask for directions once she locates the Fighter's Guild and figures it must be close. Upon entering the guild, she meets a character named Erwin that tells her she needs to speak with Falcar, and that he's the local guild leader for Chadenhall. Falcar seems... not so friendly. Are you sure you're up to it? You seem a little slow. He casually insults Fargathina as she asks after the recommendation, but regardless he does permit admittance, so she becomes an associate of the Mage's Guild. Great success! Now to work towards those letters of recommendation. Falcar continues his insults as he informs her that she needs seek out a Ring of Burden that a stupid associate got a hold of and misplaced. He suspects that the aforementioned stupid associate probably intentionally tossed it down the well behind the guild. If she can retrieve it, he'll consider sending a recommendation for her, so that seems like the way to go. He also lets her know that it may be difficult to carry. That combined with the mention of the well and another associate already begins to make the mind wander. As a final comment, he informs her that she needs to meet with Dietzan in order to retrieve the well key. Upstairs, she finds Dietzan. I'm Dietzan, magician, mages guild that is. And she tells her that she's actually very suspicious of Falkar, and further suspects that he may have had something to do with the disappearance of the aforementioned stupid associate, whom we now know is named Vidkun. Dietzan seems very concerned about this fellow, and in an effort to help us, gives us the buoyancy spell which allows Fargathina to breathe underwater and reduces burden ever so slightly. Overall, the guild hall is filled with goofy but welcome members, Falkar aside. Either way, it's time to step outside and take a look at this well. It's located directly behind the Mage's Guild, as Falkar said it would be. Opening it with the key, Fargathina dives into the well to see what mysteries can be laid to rest inside. 
Not far into the depths of the well, a floating corpse can be seen, and upon closer inspection, it appears to be Vidkun. He's holding the Ring of Burden that Falkar asked us to fetch, and it weighs a whopping 150 stones. One can surmise that Falkar put the ring in the well and asked Vidkun to retrieve it as either a cruel joke or a method of eliminating the guild associate, though it's not clear which. After making a quick trip back to the guild in order to buy a stronger Ease Burden spell from Trayvond, Fargothina jumps back into the well to secure the ring in question and heads back to the guild hall. Unable to locate Falkar, we speak with Dietzan and she informs us that some things have happened during our absence. Dietzan admits that she confronted Falkar about the way he had been treating Vidkun, and she threatened to report Falkar to the Council of Mages, at which point she claimed Falkar appeared as though he was going to kill her, but instead began ranting and left the guild. Unfortunately, she's not sure if he ever wrote the recommendation, so she suggests that we check his room to see if we can find one, while simultaneously telling us to keep an eye out for anything unusual to report. She also states that the ring is effectively useless, so we can discard it anywhere we like. Heading downstairs to check Falkar's private room, there doesn't appear to be anything suspicious immediately, and certainly no letter of recommendation. Stumbling upon a locked dresser, Fargathina uses the lockpick she picked up in the Imperial sewers to break in, as she didn't have a powerful enough spell handy, and inside she discovers two black soul gems. Unsure of what to make of these mysterious gems, she picks them up and heads back upstairs to show the evidence to Dietzan. She says she'll take them and forward them with her report to the Council of Mages, stating that things are worse than she had expected. Dietzan offers to write a letter of recommendation for us, and with that, we've managed to get our first letter of recommendation from a mage guild hall. I think these sorts of quests can provide a real value to a game. Sure, you're not being sent off to find some contrived nonsense from a Draugr dungeon, but what happens in a quest like this I find to be very elegant in its simplicity. You get to speak to all members of the guild hall and get differing viewpoints on the happening, and develops a couple of those characters within the area, all while really taking place exclusively in town. I'd even argue that a lot of the best quests in this game take place within town zones and don't have anything to do with dungeons at all. Despite personally feeling as though the dungeon crawling is one of the weaker aspects of the series, Bethesda really seems to feel otherwise as is evident with Skyrim and the incessant dungeon diving. Now there are some good quests to be found in Skyrim, like Blood on the Ice and so on, but I feel like Bethesda would do well to more heavily lean into this style of quest moving forward with the Elder Scrolls VI in consideration, develop the characters in a given area better, give the player reasons to speak with them in topics that come from scenarios like this that can culminate in something changing or altering our viewpoint on a given area, NPC, or topic. Here we find that the guild leader is either flat out evil or has some greater motivation going on even if it's a bit heavy handed in the delivery, and perhaps we'll uncover more regarding that as we proceed forward into the game and the quest line. I really like this quest as a general rule. I find it to be a great use of the burden mechanic in the sense that you are sent to the bottom of the well and the environmental storytelling in terms of the corpse of Vid Kuhn floating down there with that being one of the only possessions on it. In light of the entire questline, it also serves a purpose with the introduction of certain characters and brings forth some unclear motivations and actions that lead to the player to question certain aspects. I think while this is one of the simple recommendation requests, I also believe it is one of the more effective ones. All said and done in a quick afternoon's work, Fargathina pulls out her map and examines the area, searching for the closest town in order to begin her journey for the next letter of recommendation. The closest town appears to be in the northern mountains named Bruma, so she heads out of the city gates and toward the northwestern horizon. The walk to Bruma was peaceful and without event for the most part. A couple of wolves were to be found, but otherwise only a beautiful afternoon sky with a fantastic view of the imperial city far below. Beautiful grass, trees, and hillscapes slowly gave way to a snowy and more desolate environment as Fargathina closed in on the city of Bruma. Finally approaching the city gates, she met a Khajiit outside of the town walls and asked her about rumors, and she suggested the Fighters Guild is always recruiting. Dismissing this, as her only aspirations were for magical ascendancy, Fargathina moved on and spoke with the guard immediately outside the gate who told her where the main points of interest were in the town, including the Mage's Guild. Before visiting, however, she decided to take a stop at the local inn right next to the town gate, Olav's Tap and Tack. Strangely, upon entry, a character named Angar the World Weary stood up immediately and vaulted a plate across the room at an incredible speed, only to begin talking of some local trivial matters with the innkeeper. Best to keep your wits about you in a place like this, it would seem. A room could be found for a modest price, and the innkeeper appeared amenable, and thus far Gothina slept in for the remainder of the evening, 
hoping to get an energetic and early start on our future task in Bruma. Fargathena rises bright and early, rushing out the end door to seek out the mage's guild she was told about by the guard at the gate the day prior. Upon entry, it seems a little... empty. A woman named Jean is at the front desk conjuring minions and seems overly friendly. Asking after the recommendation letter, Jean tells us that we must do her a favor and then she will write the letter. The favor? Finding a missing guild member by the name of Jaskar. Apparently, he has been missing for a few days, and it simply wouldn't look good for council members to drop by and find a member missing. So off we go, searching the guild hall for clues, as she gives us precious little to go off of, aside from suggesting that perhaps a spell has gone wrong. The guild does appear fairly empty, if spacious. Not much seems to go on here, and certainly is far larger, yet less populated than the previous guild in Chaden Hall. Downstairs, Fargathena finds a fellow named Volonaro, who suggests he could offer us practical jokes or item recharging services. After browsing his wares, we ask after Jaskar, only to be told we aren't likely to find him, and he also suggests a spell may have gone wrong as well. Heading back upstairs, Selena appeared in the side room next to Jean. Apparently, she's the guild alchemist, and after browsing her wares, when asked about Jaskar, she says she absolutely won't be participating or getting in the middle of anything. And if I'd like to ask about any of that, I need to keep it to Jaskar and Volinaro. So back to Volinaro we go. After a bit of bribery and speechcraft, Volinaro agrees that he can let us in on Jaskar's location, but we have to do a little favor for him first that includes a prank. This prank appears to be stealing a book from Jean's private quarters, seemingly so that she will spend countless hours looking for it. Everyone here seems to not outright hate Jean, but strongly dislike her for her alleged lack of ability in the magical arts, even though she appears to be conjuring creatures just fine. Volinaro provides us with a slightly stronger unlock spell than we had prior, so upstairs we go into Jean's private chambers to find this book. Casting upon her desk, the book in question is readily available, and we swipe that, something Fargathena is not unfamiliar with, and head back downstairs to inform Volinaro that we've acquired the item. But before we can make it to the stairs, we find him meandering on the first floor. He seems willing to hold up his end of the bargain and tells us that if we want to find Jaskar to come back to the living quarters later, around 10 p.m., which seems suspicious. Fargathena decides to take a walk about town while in contemplation of the day's events, stopping by the general store to offload some goods that may have fallen into her pocket while meandering Jean's room earlier. On her way back to the guild hall, she overhears a guard speaking with a resident about a local murder, and this catches her interest. Doing a quick 180, Fargathena asks the local resident about what they were speaking of, a man named Raynal Dralis. He states that he's a vampire hunter that just showed up recently in Bruma. Not only that, but he has already found a vampire among them. The resident doesn't seem convinced that the victim was a vampire, though, as he seemed like a very likable fellow. She'll need to remember that for later, as once she resolves this business with Jaskar, she intends to ask after that topic and find out what's going on. But for now, back to the guild to loiter a bit until 10pm. When the time comes, Fargathena casts the Protect spell and readies Chill Touch just in case, as she has a questionable feeling about this meeting. Heading to Volanaro's room, it does seem as though this feeling was misplaced, as Volorano reveals Jaskar with haste and no ill intent seems evident. Both of them laugh about Jean missing her book and speak about how they enjoy these sorts of pranks done to the guild hall leader. This mainly seems based on her lack of magical ability, which is constantly referenced when you speak to any character other than Jean in the building. Funnily enough, Jean was walking by their room while we were having this conversation, so one would think that she overheard the whole thing, but upon approach she seems none the wiser. We let her know that Jaskar is found and accounted for, which she seems grateful for. Mentioning that she appears to have misplaced something, perhaps explaining why she was down in the living quarters when hers are on the second floor, she dismisses it and states that our recommendation is as good as done. With that, we've completed our goal at the Bruma Mages Guild, and it's time to look into that local gossip concerning this vampire hunter. Despite being late at night, this matter seems pressing, so Fargathena heads to the home of the slain individual and is immediately confronted by a member of the Bruma Guard named Carius Renelius, suggesting that we need to leave and that everything is under control. A few bribes later, Carius is more willing to speak with us. He reveals that Brayden was a vampire and that Raynal has slain him. Further, two weeks ago, two bodies were found stashed outside of town, and luckily Raynal arrived in town claiming he was a vampire hunter. Allegedly, he tracked the vampire to this very house, and when he came in around noon, Brayden was sleeping and he was promptly dispatched by Raynal. K 
precarious claims during the follow-up investigation, others corroborated that Braden hadn't been seen out of his home during the day and concludes that they don't really need any help in the investigation, but appreciates her offer. Carius seems overly impressed with the vampire hunter Raynal, stating that it only took him a day to track down the alleged vampire. After our discussion, he says we should feel free to question anyone in town about the whole affair, and it seems reasonable to start with the deceased's wife, crying in the corner. Erline seems to be in a state of complete shock, exclaiming that her husband was no vampire and that no one will listen to her. Finally getting her to calm down a little bit, we attempt to get her to recount the events of the situation. She states that she had come home only a few hours ago and found the door wide open with her husband dead and a Dunmer standing over him. Screaming, she ran out into the street and figured the city watch must have been nearby because they arrived very quickly. The Dunmer then identified himself as Raynal Dralis and claimed he was a vampire hunter and that Brayden was the target he had acquired. The guards, seemingly already familiar with Raynal, searched the house and found a third body, that of a beggar, in the basement. Upon finding the third body, the guards sent for Carius, the criminal investigator for the town of Bruma. Within minutes, Carius was convinced by Raynal that Brayden was indeed a vampire. Fargathena suggests that the evidence doesn't look all that great for Brayden, to which Erline agrees but suggests that the evidence was obviously planted here, as why would he stash a corpse in his own house? Going further, she recounts that the guards are making a big deal out of Brayden not being seen outside of his house during the day, but states that it's obvious he wouldn't be. He works at night, and therefore must sleep during the day, and wonders why that would make him a vampire by default. She also claims she's seen this Randall character before, but can't quite recall where, so she begs us to help clear her husband's name. What a wild scenario. Taking all of that new information in, Vargathena decides to head back to her favorite inn, Olav's Tap and Tack, as these places tend to be a hive of information regarding those that are coming or going. Olav seems to think that the guards could have this case wrong, as it would be hard to imagine Brayden as a vampire. Olav swears he has seen him outside in the daylight before, so unless he just recently came down with vampirism, he would bet that the guards are simply wrong with their conclusion in this case. After hearing that Raynal killed Brandon, he wasn't sure what to think, but after our visit to him, he's beginning to wonder even more. Unfortunately, even after several bribes, Olav wouldn't reveal any further information about Raynal to us. It seemed like he was holding something back, so Fargathena decided to check out the other tavern up on the hill, the Gerald View Inn, and see if she could dig up any clues. Speaking to the innkeeper, half at Hollowleg, it is revealed that Raynal is in fact staying at Olav's Tap and Tack. Heading straight back to Olav, he still won't budge on the information, so we decide it's time to employ some of our magic trickery, but first we need a new spell. Running back to the Mages Guild and speaking to Selina, she offers to sell us a beguiling touch spell, which causes a small charm effect on touch. Purchasing and thanking Selina, off we go to use our newfound spell on our dear friend Olav, which works to wonderful effect as he reveals Raynal is staying in the last room down the hall and offers us the key willingly. How charming of him. Entering Raynal's room, nothing immediately appears to be amiss until by chance a small portion of a book is observed that appears to have fallen behind the dresser. It is titled Gelleborn's Journal, and it details a group of three friends that stumbled upon an ancient artifact in an alien ruin. The members of the group agreed to stash the artifact in a safe place until more research could be done, and each member also took one key to the chest, all three keys being necessary to open the chest. Heading back to the main room of the inn, we ask Olav about this Gelleborn. He says it's odd that we would mention that name, as it was Raynal's last hunted vampire that was tracked and killed in the city of Skingrad, and this is revealed to be why the guards of Bruma trusted Raynal so much, because word had come up from Skingrad concerning Raynal and his accomplishments. Racing back to Airline's house, we confront Carius about Gelleborn, and he seems immediately frustrated that Fargathena even brings up the name. Complaining that people can't keep their lips sealed, he goes on to reveal that the Skingrad City Watch had informed them that Gelleborn was killed by Raynal not long ago, and that he was obviously a vampire. Disagreeing with this assessment, Fargathena presents the journal found in Raynal's room, and Caria seems floored, stating that everything seems to make perfect sense now. Filled with a new purpose, Carius tells Fargathena to meet him at Olav's Tap and Tack in an hour once he is able to get a search party together. Unfortunately, upon meeting with Carius after one hour has passed, he lets us know that he recently received word from one of the scouts watching the roads outside of Bruma that Reyna was seen escaping west and was able to lose the scout in the mountains. However, Carius seems to think that a nearby cave to the west matches the one spoken about in the journal. 
the Boreal Stone Cave and concludes that must be where Raynal is headed. Deciding that sending a whole group of guards would lack tact, he suggests that Fargathena go alone and stop Raynal before he acquires the artifact. Heading out into the cool and snowy afternoon, Fargathena begins to circle the town in an attempt to head in a westwardly direction to find this alleged cave, hot on the trail of Raynal. Along the way, she finds what appears to be two Imperial Legion guards in an archery contest with each other as the target. After a few minutes, one fells the other and dashes away, at which point Fargathena helps herself to the remains of the losing guard. Strange, but can't look a gift horse in the mouth, especially when spells are just so expensive. Fargathena passes a small farm to the south of her as she continues her trek westward, and finally discovers the cave Carius had mentioned. Upon entering, there doesn't seem to be anyone here. Eyeing a chest in the middle of the main room, Fargathena attempts to open the chest, but it seems she needs all three keys to do so. While looking around other areas of the cave, the dark elf Raynal sneaks up on her and begins a conversation, explaining that he felt she would catch on to him sooner or later and that leaving the journal behind was a stupid mistake. Raynal doesn't seem that disturbed by the situation, claiming that once he kills us he will no longer need the vampire ruse and will be able to carry on free of consequence. After giving him multiple opportunities to surrender, the fight begins and he is quickly chilled to death by our frozen fingers. Finally, the moment arrives to discover what lies in the chest that these three men found worthy enough to build a covenant around. Upon opening it, a mundane amulet is revealed with no special properties. Confused, Fargathena grabs the amulet, loots her adversary, and heads back towards Bruma for answers. There's something interesting about this Dunmer, Raynal. Perhaps it was just the lighting in this cave, but he seems to have a green skin like an orc. I've never seen a Dunmer quite like that. It's a strange sight to behold. Speaking of Dunmer, I wish they hadn't done a complete 180 on their voices from Morrowind. Gone are the ashy and almost raspy voices we found in Vardenfell, replaced with something that sounds completely different. While these voices are still fine, they lack the defined character they had in Morrowind, and I'd love to see a return to that seemingly ash-laden tone of voice they had back then. Entering Erline's home, she asks what news we bring, to which we reply that we have both slain Raynil, avenging her husband, and acquired the mundane amulet from the chest in the cave. She begins telling us that long ago she made a promise to Brayden that she would never reveal to anyone what she is about to reveal to us, but because we've avenged the unjust death of Brayden, that he would understand why she has decided to break the pact. It turns out that Brayden never really trusted his other group members, so before he secured the amulet in the chest within the cave, he placed a special enchantment upon the amulet which would conceal its true nature. Fortunately, Brayden gave his wife the special command word that will restore the amulet to its true identity for future possibility of him dying and her coming into possession of all three keys. Handing over the amulet, Airline speaks the magical word, Brotherhood, and the truth of the amulet is revealed. Claiming she has no use for the amulet and seemingly in a much better mood now that her husband has been avenged, she hands it to Fargathena to keep as a reward for her efforts in righting these wrongs. The amulet itself is called the Phylactery of Liveness, and it adds a constant fortify speed plus 5 to oneself upon wearing it. So now a good bit quicker than we were before, we exit Erline's house and leave her to her thoughts to mourn her wrongly killed husband. Heading back to Olav's Tap and Tack to secure some rest after all this hard work, Fargathena experiences her first increase in level. She realizes that all her life she had been coasting along as if she was in a dream and suddenly, facing the trials of the last few days, she had come alive. Feeling stronger and with greater will than ever before to continue her quest, Fargathena readies herself for her next journey, to the next city in her quest for the recommendations she needs in order to join the accredited and famous Arcane University. As a new day dawns, Fargathena sets course for the city of Coral. Heading to the south and west, she finds little in the way to disturb her travels aside from the beautiful vistas of the Imperial City once again from such great mountainous heights. She is accosted by two rogue bandits, and while they appear to be hanging about a cave, being a woman on a mission she opts not to investigate any further in this particular case. Taking a few bottles of ale and beer as part of the spoils, she continues on, practicing her magical skills on the path toward Coral. By the time she reaches the outskirts of Coral, night has fallen across the land and she notices that an area not too far from the city proper is called Wayne and Priory. This does ring a small bell in her mind, the ravings of a seemingly mad emperor, but dismissing it for the time being she continues toward her target, the city of Coral. Upon entering the city, being that night has fallen, Vargathena decides to head towards the nearest tavern to catch up on some sleep and start the next day fresh. 
It would seem that a pleasant inn by the name of the Oak and Crozier is right next to the gate to the city, staffed by a Khajiit by the name of Talisma. She offers us a room for the meager price of ten gold, and we agree to the arrangement, heading upstairs to sleep off the weariness of the long road to coral, dreaming of magical ascendancy. Bright and early, Fargathena scopes out the town of Coral, asking a nearby guard for directions to both the guilds and services offered in the town proper. After discovering both tidbits of information, she heads to the general store to offload any extra goods that may have accumulated from the trip or otherwise, and is met by a mother and daughter Argonian duo operating the shop. They seem welcoming enough, and are even more so when the charm spell is deployed. Making one further stop at the smithy to sell the last remaining goods that the general shop wasn't interested in, it's off to the Mages Guild to see what task awaits us in Coral. This guild is immediately contrasting that of Bruma due to the seeming flurry of activity upon entering the door. There are a great many people gathered right at the entrance, though speaking to a few of them reveals a couple aren't even strictly related to the guild. Rather, they are husbands or wives of guild members that are perhaps visiting at this time early in the morning. After browsing the wares and speaking to all of the guild members, Fargathena finds Tikius, an Argonian that appears to be in charge of the Coral Guild Hall. Of course, he is in need of a favor to be performed before he can write us a letter of recommendation, as to be expected. In this particular case, he would like us to clear up what he calls a small matter involving a character named Irana. Apparently, Irana and Tikius have an unpleasant history, as he puts it. We learn from other members of the guild that Tikius is quite the stickler for the Mage Guild rules and prefers to follow them to a T, and that is possibly where this disagreement spawned. Apparently, Irana is suspected he was using his powers inappropriately in the past, though at this stage it's hard to guess why that might be because he, allegedly, so strongly adheres to protocol. Either way, Tikius has observed Irana to be in town, though she has not directly approached him. He would like us to investigate and find out why exactly she's in Coral, and subsequently find a way to be rid of her, as he is concerned she may be out and about spreading her lies, as he says. None around the guild seem to have many details on what exactly happened with Irana, with one exception being the wood elf named Othrogger, who states that to the best of his knowledge, she complained to the council until Tikius was removed from his position at the Arcane University, though he doesn't explain why or what evidence was presented to cause this. Simultaneously, through speaking with others, we learn that she was expelled from the guild, though again with no reasoning as to why that happened, just that she caused all kinds of trouble while she was there. With what little learned, Fargathena takes a liking to all the alchemical equipment left lying about in the guild, and much of it accidentally falls into her pocket and is subsequently sold to a charmed Angalmo who doesn't seem to mind that he's buying back the things that were previously on the shelf behind him. No harm, no foul. After all, those spells are very expensive. Hopefully Fargathena's wandering fingers don't land her back in the Imperial prison again, but no matter. Information in hand, Fargathena heads outside to find Irana skulking around the exterior of the Mage's Guild. A quick conversation with her doesn't yield much, but she solicits us for a favor that we should keep just between us. The task seems simple, to collect a book called Fingers of the Mountain from a nearby... place. She insists that we do not speak of this to Tikius, but of course, being that we're trying to get a letter of recommendation from him, Fargathena immediately does a 180 and tells Tikius this information. He seems excited about the concept of the book existing and the whereabouts being known. He insists that the book needs to remain with the guild for safekeeping and that he trusts we will do the right thing by acquiring the book and swiftly bringing it back to him. Conflicting desires in hand, Fargathena begins to head up the mountain trail in order to find this location and subsequently the book. After pausing for a nice view of Coral and a bit of the Imperial City, Fargathena stumbles upon the area in question and discovers a charred corpse containing the book they are both seeking. Grabbing the book, she heads back down the slope the way she came, fighting a few ravenous wolves along the way. Upon entering the guild again and providing the book to Tikius, he seems pleased and states that he will write our letter of recommendation, but he needs to go in order to store the book properly. Seeming to pick up that this book could be worth quite a bit, Fargathena tags behind him in order to discover where the book is stored and swipes it. Speaking to Arana shortly thereafter, she's quite upset that we handed the book over, but suggests we steal it back. Little does she know that it has already been done. Fargathena presents the book to her as she promises to still provide the reward she initially offered us. She states that we need to come back in a day or so while she attempts to decode the book. While waiting for that, Fargathena decides to check in on the Grey Mare, a tavern apparently known for housing the seedier sort where Irana is staying. Upon entering, a man named Valis Odil asks us if we've seen his sons. 
Asking for more details, he reveals that Rallus and Antus are planning to fight some creatures that are continuing to harass the Odil farm. He further reveals that the town guards are not willing to help them, despite the farm being a stone's throw from the town proper. However, his advanced age makes him a little bit hesitant to stand aside his sons in battle, so he asks us to join them in their quest. With no offer of a reward on the table, Fargathina still decides this is the right thing to do and agrees to help. Heading toward the farm, she encounters the sun speaking just outside of the aforementioned Wayne and Priory. This is a bit of a funny moment to me. Now don't get me wrong, I love the voice acting in Oblivion, but I think we all know there are some limitations set in place there. I think there were only a small handful of actors that perform most of the roles in the game. This case is one in particular where that really stands out to me. When you approach these two, you can hear them talking back and forth, and not only are they voiced by the same actor, but it's also the same which voiced their father. There's just something hilarious about these characters going back and forth with the same voice actor. I suppose you could chalk it up to them being direct relatives, but still a funny Oblivion moment. Antis, calm down. You'll be leaving soon enough. I just can't wait. This is going to be the greatest fight ever! This is no joke, Antis, and it's nothing to be excited about. If you don't want to be doing this, then why are you even here? Father and I can handle this. The first brother, Rallis, seems to be more cautious and reserved seeming only a little surprised after we tell him his father isn't coming. He accepts our help and agrees that it's time to go to the farm. The other son, Antus, seems much more gung-ho and short on thinking. Either way, we begin the very, very slow march down to the farm. You'd think they'd have a little more pep in their step considering the situation, but no, it's a really slow walk down the hill. We arrive at the Odil farm to a foggy scene. While we wait for the brothers to take their spots, Fargathena decides it's a solid time to help herself to the many crops available in the pen. Before she's finished, she hears cries of the brothers as goblins rapidly approach. Slaying them easily with her magic and their swords, Fargathena figures all is well, but it is not. More hordes of goblins approach, multiple waves in fact. Unfortunately, due to mana constraints of an inexperienced mage, neither brother was able to be saved. Stripping of them of their valuables and checking the house for more, Fargathena sets out to tell the father the good and bad news. The good news, sir, is that your farm is now safe. The bad news is that both of your sons are, unfortunately, dead. But they died a heroic death in the crop field. Understandably, Vallis is a bit upset about this and regrettably lets us know that any small amount of coin he could have offered as a reward instead must be put towards the burial fees. A regrettable end to the tale, but that's the price of asking a novice mage to assist your family in a battle, I suppose. Fargathena feels a little bad, but there isn't much to be done about the matter, as it's over and done with. After selling all of the collected farm produce to the Argonian merchant, Fargathena decides to rest for the evening before she sets out for the town of Skingrad in the morning. She figures that if Arana is done with her translation by the time she leaves, maybe she'll stop by and grab it. If not, no matter. The primary goal of visiting Coral has been accomplished, and that was to retrieve yet another letter of recommendation. Though the goal was achieved, Fargathena decided to loiter a while in Coral and accomplish a few goals. For one, she decided to train her armorer skill in order to help keep what little equipment she had in better order and practice a little magic, staying in the inn one further night. She realized that she was just catching on to the secrets of success. It turns out that it was just a matter of concentration. Upon the morning, Fargathena awoke and met with Arana on her way out of town. She claimed she was able to translate the book, that most of it would not be of interest to us. Yet there were a couple of pages that she thought might intrigue us, which she handed over for our review. It appeared to indicate that if we were to acquire a Welkin Stone, that we may be able to unlock some secret power or magic from the ruined pillar. This in mind, in case she ever came across such an item, she set off for the next town on her map of Cyrodiil in search of recommendations. Skingrad. On the way to Skingrad, Fargathena came across a hollowed out shell of a town, Hackdirt, she was told by the seemingly unfriendly locals. Though she asked around, not much more could be derived from the townsfolk aside from threats. After some further investigation, she decided she was not at all welcome and should just continue on her path to Skingrad. Passing through the hilly forest, Skingrad finally came into view over the grassy hills. Towering spires lined the city walls and it appeared to be quite prosperous from the exterior. The entrance to the city was flanked by wineries. In fact, she met immediately one of the proprietors of the vineyard, Gaston Cyril. He seemed friendly enough and spoke of several vintages she might try if she could get a hold of them. In comparison to Hackdirt, Skingrad seemed overly inviting, so she strolled right into town. 
Once inside, her expectation was that this was a fairly prosperous town appeared to be confirmed. A long road splits the town in two with a section of the city on either side. Apparently, this was a heavily used trading route historically, and the city simply populated on either side of it. Making her way toward the Mages Guild, Fargathena noticed that a man was chasing after her, and upon catching up to her, he stated that they couldn't talk in the street as it was too public, but she should meet him behind the Great Chapel at midnight, making certain that we are not followed in the process. While he offers no further details, he does state that he will make it worth our while. Never one to turn down a septum, Fargathena stores this in the rear of her mind as something to see to depending on what her business at the guild pertains to. Entering the Mage's Guild, it seems to have a rather cramped interior and lacks larger open spaces of other guilds she has visited recently. Otherwise, it seems to be quite a nice building. After speaking to an Argonian named Druja, she directs us to someone named Adrienne in order to check in on our recommendation. Fargathena also decides to ask about the man who spoke to her outside the guild, Glarthir, to which Druja responds that he's known to be a bit strange, but overall he's tolerated and considered an eccentric member of the town. As usual, Fargathena loots every alchemical item in sight and pawns these off to the local guild alchemist as if they had been acquired elsewhere in order to fatten her pockets before finding and speaking with Adrienne. Adrienne mentions that she's been busy, but she does have a small matter that needs taken care of. Apparently a member named Erthor hasn't been seen in a while and she'd like me to investigate the matter. She suggests that we start by simply asking around the guild hall and seeing what other members have to say about the matter. Heading downstairs and speaking to Viggy the Cautious, he states that he hasn't seen him in a while, but assumed he was still out in a place called Bleak Flats Cave, as he usually stays there. But he doesn't elaborate any further than that, other than the fact that he can't seem to recall where that is exactly. He does indicate that Druja should be able to tell us where the cave is, so after thanking him, Fargathena heads over to find the Argonian. Druja says that this isn't the first time he's been away, so she hasn't been that concerned with his absence, but she does know where Bleak Flats Cave is, and marks it on our map so we can easily find it. However, she does have a little more information. It turns out that Adrienne is the one who told him to go there, as she didn't want him to practice any longer within the guild hall. She further states that Adrienne probably doesn't even remember her own decree, and that it wouldn't hurt for us to remind her that it was her idea to begin with to send him off to the cave. Before returning to Adrienne, Fargathena speaks to Solanus Vassinus about Erthor, and he speaks of an awful scamp incident last year, but that otherwise he was a nice guy. Essentially, Adrienne had expelled him to the cave as a result of these experiments. Fargathena decides it's time to get the full story from Adrienne, so she returns upstairs to speak with her. Adrienne's memory is immediately jogged by mentioning the Bleak Flats cave, and she says that surely we must do something about it, and by we she means Fargathena. She wishes her luck and offers up a spell of weak fireball, indicating that it might not be a frictionless encounter. Considering the gift of a fire spell, Fargathena decides it may be a prudent time to purchase a weakness to fire spell to work in tandem with her offensive magic before leaving town. After that, Fargathena heads northwest towards Bleak Flats Cave. The cave isn't far from the city of Skingrad, rather just a short walk. It's not a noteworthy location, simply a door built into a rock and a field of grass. Upon entering, Fargathena is immediately attacked by deranged zombies, and this puts her into some of her first real combat encounters she has experienced. At first, she tries using her frost touch spells, but they don't seem terribly effective. Remembering the fireball spell she was given, she begins using that element to much better effect. Though she attempts to use her limited conjuration skills to bring forth skeletal warriors to her side of the battle, they prove to be mostly useless in combat, and she has to rely on her destruction capabilities. Working her way through the cave, she continues to slay the deranged zombies until she makes her way into what appears to be a makeshift living space, with Erthor residing in it. Erthor seems exceedingly grateful, as it seems he was trapped here and has been hiding from the zombies. Asking if he can follow us back to town, Fargathena agrees and works her way out of the cavern and back outside. But by this time, night has fallen, and she estimates that it's about 8.30 in the evening. With some hours to go yet until her midnight encounter, she heads back to Skingrad with Erthor. Upon entering the Mage's Guild, Erthor exclaims to Adrian that he's been rescued and he's glad to be back. She criticizes him and states that he needs to be more careful, which is an interesting stance considering she essentially exiled him there to begin with. After concluding their conversation, the both of them spontaneously begin speaking about how much they love the shop just around the corner, while Viggy the Cautious stands awkwardly between the two of them, then begins to wander off after heading downstairs, he can be overheard asking where Erthor is, stating he hasn't seen him in a while, despite just standing in front of him during the conversation with Adrian. The NPCs in Oblivion have special conversation lines that they are programmed to speak when encountering each other. 
and they can make for hilarious interactions like this. But I think it's absolutely one of the charms this game offers. Good evening. I've bought a good number of things at Colobian Traders, and Gunda is a friendly sort. I've bought a number of things from Gunda. I have How always do you do? been satisfied. Anvil is all in an uproar. First the chapel attack, now the prophet ranting about the end of the world. It can't be. No doubt. Did you hear that someone played yet another prank on Jean Frasoric in Bruma? I don't know how she keeps falling for these yes. things. Where's Earth no, come haven't on. Seen him lately. Of course. He's they say that when you murder him. someone, the Maybe Dark I'm Brotherhood him. comes to you. After speaking with Adrian, she says that she's very happy with our work in securing Earthor, and that she'll be sending her recommendation in as soon as she gets a spare moment. Mission now accomplished, Fargathena heads downstairs and out of the Mages Guild, overhearing Viggy the Cautious once again repeating that he hasn't seen Earthor. Upon exiting the guild hall, Fargathena loiters around on the streets for a couple of hours, burning time until her meeting with the mysterious Glarthir. At midnight exactly, she heads toward the Grand Chapel and walks around the back to find the elf waiting for her in the shadows. He seems excited to see us and speaks in a friendly manner, asking again to be sure we weren't followed. He says that he thinks he can trust us, but nobody else in town, as he claims that they are all in on it and are all watching him. He then solicits us with, I'll pay you gold. You like gold, don't you? Lots of gold. To investigate certain individuals that he believes are following him. The task seems simple enough. Tail them and see where they go and who they may be reporting to. Fargathena agrees as this seems to be a simple enough task and if he's not right about it, no harm, no foul. He then concludes by mentioning again that he will pay her plenty of gold. He states that he'd like her to start with a Bernadette Pinellas. Apparently she lives immediately across from Glarthir and if we wait outside of his house around 6am, we should see her appear as he claims she is watching him. So we are to follow her and determine who she reports to and that we'll meet again at the same time and place the subsequent night. As the final condition of employment, he asks that we do not attempt to contact him during the day as to not blow our cover. Agreeing, Fargathena heads toward Glarthir's house in front of the chapel, finds a good hiding spot with a solid vantage point, and loiters until the appointed hour. While loitering in the streets, Fargathena is awoken suddenly. Apparently, a one Captain Dion of the Count's Guard has taken a special interest in us asking after Glarthir, and would like to know why it is we are inquiring to townspeople about him. Of course, Fargathena tells him she was merely curious as she doesn't want to blow her cover. After all, this Captain Dion could be involved in the plot that is starting to have some merit in her mind. After all, if there's nothing going on, would she really be contacted so quickly by such a high authority after just asking a couple of townsfolk about Glarthir? Captain Dion isn't pleased with her response and states that Glarthir is crazy and asks that we shouldn't get involved with him if he asks us to perform any tasks. Fargathena is immediately suspicious of this Captain Dion. Glarthir could definitely be onto something. Watching the Captain leave, Fargathena slinks back into the shadows to await the final hours. Having waited an hour or so past six and seen nothing yet, Fargathena sees Glarthir in the distance near the chapel and decides to ask him what the deal is since Bernadette hasn't shown up. But he berates us for speaking in public and puts on a show as if we were asking him the time. Deciding that if he's taking it this seriously, she should too. And no sooner than she returns to her post, Bernadette appears to exit her home and head towards the church in Glarthir. She appears to pass him by and to enter the church, so Fargathena follows her and observes her seeming to sit idly in one of the church pews. After a while, she gets up and exits the building and confronts Glarthir. Perhaps there is something to this. Deciding to follow her a bit further after that encounter, Fargathena follows her out of town and into the Sorrel Brothers' vineyard, where she appears to start working with the vines. Deciding that she's seen enough, Fargathena heads back to Skingrad proper and waits for the appointed time to meet with Glarthir behind the church to give him an update on the mission. Upon meeting with Glarthir at midnight, he insists that she was watching and following him, to which Fargathena agrees. She did appear to be watching and following Glarthir in the early portions of the day, even interacting with him. Glarthir is excited to hear confirmation of his suspicions and offers Fargathena 150 gold for her efforts, but mentions that there is yet another he would like her to investigate, a man by the name of Tautius Sextius. He states that he's generally a quiet fellow, but has been identified as one of his key suspects. He points out that he lives across the East Bridge, and even more suspiciously, he lives alone. 
Glarthir wants us to follow him and find out what he's doing when he's not watching Glarthir. Perhaps find out who he's reporting to. He concludes by stating that we should absolutely not let him see us, as he is far more dangerous than he appears. After conversing with Glarthir, Fargathena heads off to the appointed area and finds a secluded partial alleyway across from his home in which to lay in wait for Tautius. Sure enough, he emerges from his house not long after 9 a.m. Crouching and keeping some distance, Fargathena follows him towards the town gate. He stops to speak to what appears to be a beggar standing near Glarthir. Suspicious. After heading out the town gate after Tautius, it seems he's walking up the hill towards the castle. This is terrible news, as it could mean that this conspiracy runs all the way to the top. Following him further into the castle, into the county hall, he appears to have a meeting with Mercator Hosidius. Having seen enough, Fargathena heads back towards Skingrad to wait around until evening to meet again with Glarthir. At the appointed time of midnight, Glarthir appears and eagerly asks what she's learned about Tautius. Considering the first thing Tautius did after leaving his house was walk in the direction of Glarthir and have that suspicious conversation with the nearby beggar before reporting to his superior, it seems likely Glarthir is right and we tell him as much. Glarthir commends Fargathena's excellent work and gladly hands over another reward of 200 gold, stating that there is one last person which needs to be investigated before everything is concluded. He asks if she is familiar with David Surreal of the Surreal Vineyards. Glarthir states that he is likely the ringleader of the whole conspiracy and to be very careful, but to watch him in the morning once he leaves his house. Fargathena thinks back to when she first came to Skengrad and how she spoke to David's brother, Gaston. It's entirely possible she dodged a bullet if he is also involved in this ballooning conspiracy. Making her way back toward the residential area, Fargathena slinks up to the covered entrance to the two sisters lodge, concealing herself in the shadows immediately across from the surreal household, and lies in wait until morning, wondering what revelations this day will bring. Again, Glarthir appears to be right on the money, as David appears outside of his home at approximately 7am and proceeds down the streets of Skingrad. Fargathena follows at a reasonable distance, appearing as casual and nondescript as possible. She follows him outside of the town and immediately observes a suspicious conversation transpiring with an elf near the stables before he heads on toward the vineyard. A likely place to go, and while it seems harmless at first, Fargathena realizes in horror that it's the same location Bernadette had visited and concludes that this must be one of their common meeting spots to exchange and relay information. Having seen enough, she rushes back to town to wait until nightfall in order to meet with Glarthir so she can relay the grim findings. At midnight, Glarthir meets with Fargathina during the midst of a torrential downpour and asks what she discovered, at which point we affirm that David is suspicious. Glarthir seems pleased and writes something down on a piece of paper and passes it to us along with 200 more gold. He states that this is the last task and that much, much more gold will be forthcoming once this task is complete and then he parts ways with Fargathena, leaving her standing in the rain as she unfolds the paper to read the scribbled text. It's a list of death, and indicates that all three suspects are to be killed. Fargathena is a little shocked, but not completely surprised. While she has a tendency to perhaps be a little more free with her hands and goods that don't necessarily belong to her, she is no murderer, of course. But this isn't murder, this is justice of a sort. If anything, she's stopping a large crime by intervening on behalf of this victim. Or at least that's the rationale she deploys to come to terms with the task. The idea of an even larger sum of gold doesn't hurt matters, either. Deciding to immediately get to work, Fargathena heads to Tautius' house, even though Glarthir does state that David should be killed first. She doesn't think it will matter much, as she plans to resolve all of this before dawn. Something she hadn't considered fully is how exactly she was going to enter the homes. They're all locked. While she's fumbled with a lockpick here and there, she's by no means an expert, but manages to fumble her way into the home after breaking many a lockpick. Donning the crimson robe that she's been carrying around since her fateful encounter with the Emperor, she sneaks through the home to the top floor, unlocking the bedroom door and creeping up slowly. With a combination of conjuration, a blade, and destruction magic, Tautius is slain on his stairwell. One conspirator down, Fargathena proceeds to Bernadette's home and repeats the process before heading across the street to enter the final target's home, David Cyril. This one could prove to be slightly more challenging due to the fact that he lives with his brother. Though she manages to dispatch David with relative ease, it does appear the commotion woke his brother Gaston as he opens the door to the bedroom after the deed is done. Though he doesn't seem immediately concerned, so Fargathena quickly closes the door and heads out of the home before he begins to suspect she may have had something to do with what happened. 
Meeting back with Fargathina behind the chapel at midnight once again, Glarther seems excited to be free of the conspirators and thanks Fargathina profusely and hands over a whopping 1,000 gold for the deed, after which he unceremoniously walks away. Feeling a little disturbed about the whole matter and unsure as to whether or not she's actually done the right thing, Fargathina decides it's better she make her way out of town before someone gets wise as to the fact that there are three murders. She decides that she'll stay at the inn for just a couple of hours to rest up and then sneak out of Skingrad before dawn to avoid suspicion. Just better to be off to her next destination, she figures. Having secured a bed, not long after lying down she's disturbed in her sleep and awoken by a figure. Her heart skips a beat and her mind begins racing to explain her actions as she suspects that the town guards have come down on her, but she turns to find a hooded figure. While it seems the town guards are, in fact, not privy to her actions, this shadowy figure appears to be. He introduces himself as Lucien Lachance and informs Fargathina that our actions have been observed by a figure he calls the Night Mother, and as a result wishes to offer us an opportunity to join their unique family. To do this we must murder a certain target at a location called the Inn of Ill Omen, somewhere southwest of the Imperial City. Before she can really process all of this information, Lucian offers her a dagger, the Blade of Woe, and reiterates what he stated, before rapidly disappearing into the hall of the inn, as if becoming invisible. Unsure what to think of the whole encounter, Fargathina decides it's probably a better idea to go ahead and leave Skingrad sooner than later. After all, if this Lucian Lachance was able to contact her about her recent actions, it's entirely possible the town guards or that suspicious Captain Dion may suspect her involvement as well. Grabbing the new dagger she received from Lucian in hand, Fargathina makes her way out of the inn and sneaks through the city streets under the cover of nightfall and exits the city of Skingrad, heading toward her next destination under the starlight, the city of Kavach. After examining her map, Fargathina determines that she will simply travel southwestward, not far from the Strid River, which functions as the border between Cyrodiil and Balenwood. Along the way, she discovers a pleasant pillar that summons a temporary suit of Daedric armor and a two-handed sword for her use on the trip. Convenient. As she approaches the city of Kavach, storm clouds begin to gather in the distance and the wind begins blowing through the trees providing an ominous sense of foreboding. Not long after she has turned north along the short path to Kavach, the first raindrops begin to fall out of the sky and a frantic high elf is seen to be dashing towards her and begins to hurriedly relay a horrific message. Kavach has been overrun. The elf, Hertel, states that gates to oblivion have opened and nightmarish creatures have poured out setting ablaze to the city and killing most within. He further states that we should get the hell out of here before it's too late. Fargathina considers for a moment, but ultimately decides Kavach is no longer on her visitation list in her quest for the Mage's Guild recommendations. It's unlikely the Mage's Guild still exists there, and considering her worldly inexperience, it's best to take the elf's recommendation and get the hell out. As she continues west along the road, Kavach to her rear, the storm clouds begin to thin as Anvil appears as she crests a hilly landscape. Anvil sits nicely on the lower end of the landscape, near the border with Balenwood on the mouth of the Strid River, and appears to be surrounded by seemingly glittering golden foliage, likely lending the name to this region called the Gold Coast. Upon entering into the city, the Mage's Guild seems to be located directly across from the main gate, so she made her way directly into the building. Anvil brings another relatively dense Mage's Guild, with small and claustrophobic rooms. A woman named Karahil is found to be tending what appears as a sort of front counter, and it seems she is the leader of this particular guild hall, so Fargathina asks her about a recommendation. Karahil indicates that this will not be some frivolous task that she may have been given at prior guild halls, and reiterates that this is a very serious matter that has consequences, before asking if she is prepared to accept such a duty in order to get the recommendation. Fargathina agrees that, yes, she's ready for such a task. Carahill explains that the Council of Mages has entrusted her with the resolution of an apparent situation that has been developing upon the Gold Road. Apparently, multiple traveling merchants have been found dead along the Gold Road recently, and even more have gone missing. The Council has deemed it Carahill's responsibility to put a stop to it, likely due to the relative proximity of her guild hall. She informs Fargathina that the killings are suspected to be the actions of a rogue mage due to the frost burns being found upon the victims, and that battle mages have been sent to the small Breen Cross Inn up the hills along the Gold Road, as it is known to be the only common link with all of the known victims. Apparently, she is to travel to this inn and meet with a contact there known as Ariel Gerard, whom will provide further instructions. Unfortunately, none of the other guild members appear to have much to say regarding this particular mission, 
probably because the actual situation is transpiring outside of the town proper, and it doesn't appear directly related to any given member of the guild. As per usual protocol, Fargathena helps herself to anything that isn't nailed down, and resells it to a charmed felon Relis. After doing so, Fargathena heads up the Golden Hillside towards the Brina Cross Inn to check in for the night and meet this Ariel. Upon trying to secure a bed for the evening, the innkeeper, Christophe Moran, takes a surprisingly strong interest as to whether or not she is a traveling merchant. Fargathena, lacking instructions to do so, pushes the question off, stating that she'd rather not say just yet, and decides to take a look for Ariel Gerard before proceeding. She is found to be speaking with another woman nearby, and upon approach states that we shouldn't speak in such a public location. Rather, she will come to us in the evening once we rent a room and speak privately. She instructs Fargathena to state only that she is a traveling merchant if asked, but nothing further. After securing the room in the inn, Fargathena is approached by the very same woman that was occupying the room with Ariel, named Kaminalda. She asked if she had overheard us declaring ourselves as a traveling merchant, and began to ask if we were worried, what with all the recent killings, and claims she hasn't left the inn in days due to the word on the street. Not sure what to think of this encounter, Fargathena makes her way to her room and takes a few hours of rest before she hears a knock on the door, presumably from Ariel. Sure enough, it's her and she gives us the details of the plan. We are to rest through the night at the inn, and once morning comes, embark on the Golden Road in an easterly direction. Ariel will be following Fargathena at a distance and with the help of another battle mage, and once the criminal reveals herself, will come to our immediate aid. Not long after traveling the road, the same common Alda from the inn of the previous night is seen to be chasing after us. Turning around to see what she needs, common Alda states that this is the end of our journey, and that she'll be taking whatever we are carrying, once we are dead of course. After complaining that the last few merchants had very little in terms of possessions, she attacks. Shortly after the magical battle begins, the battle mages can be seen running up the road to provide support in the fight against common Alda. Not long after, Kamenalda lies dead upon the road, and Ariel tells Fargathena that she's done well, and that the gold road should be a little safer, for now. She is to return to Anvil and let Karahil know that the work is complete and that they will be staying behind in order to clean things up, as she says. Upon returning to Anvil, Karahil seems surprised that the attacker was a woman, but seems to be satisfied that the problem has been resolved. She states that she will be glad to write the recommendation, but notes that it may do us little good as they have a tendency to forget the little people, as she calls them. Perhaps this indicates there is some level of resentment that Kara Hill holds toward the university, but no further elaboration is provided. With recommendation in hand, and in consideration of how long a journey it was to the next destination, Braville, Fargathena decided not to dally, and having just slept the night before, headed out for the long trek back along the southern border of Cyrodiil. The golden hills of Anvil give way quickly to greener, forested hills of central southern Cyrodiil. Fargathena stays well to the south of Skingrad, recalling her interactions there with Glarthir, as if in a fever dream, but deciding it would be best to avoid stopping by in that town for now. Far better to let things cool off and not to be present while suspicions are no doubt cast about concerning the deaths of three citizens, conspiracy or no. Oblivion has some degree of dynamic weather effects, and they are surprisingly good. Walking through the valleys on the way to Braville, as with nearing Kavach, the sky begins to darken in a very natural manner, and the wind appears to pick up strongly. Trees begin to rustle in the wind, and it truly imparts the sense of a coming storm. The weather can be sunny, cloudy, foggy, or as in this case, overcast with a potential for rain, though this time it seems that the rain misses Fargathena, and she continues on her trek towards Braville. Reaching seemingly the final hilltop, Braville can be seen in the distance, as the land begins to flatten out, becoming much more forested and low-lying. Braville seems to sit right along the water of the Nibin Bay, and is in fact built upon it. This is the very same body of water that she will be following the path of southward once she completes her task here and heads to her final destination, Leowin. For now, however, the city appears prosperous and majestic from the exterior, with the gigantic chapel being visible from quite a distance. Braville is only reachable on the northern side via a relatively long wooden bridge, leading to the town gates. Upon entry it would appear that her expectation of a wealthy city is to be diminished quite a bit, as aside from the castle and chapel, all buildings appear to be constructed of wood. Granted they are not shacks, many of them reach as high as three stories and seem a solid construction, but a far cry from the initial impression one might receive due to the towering chapel seen from afar, cresting the city walls. The quantity of beggars and the poor seems only rivaled by the imperial city. After such a substantial journey across the province of Cyrodiil, 
Fargathena seeks shelter at an inn to rest up for her unknown trials on the morrow. Fortunately, there appears to be an inn located immediately inside the town gates known as the Silver Home on the Water, and the innkeeper seems welcoming enough, more than happy to rent a room to the traveling mage. Resting overnight, she decides that she will head to the Mage's Guild first thing in the morning to see what task awaits her in Breville. Tossing away her blanket coverings, Fargathena woke up well rested and energized for her day. Making her way down the stairs of the Silver Home on the Water, she exited the building and began wandering the streets of Breville in search of the Mage's Guild. After a bit of trekking, Fargathena identified the symbol of the guild proudly placed front and center of a small but multi-story building immediately south of the massive chapel and walked through the door. Considering the building appeared so small from the exterior, the interior central area was surprisingly spacious, especially in comparison to recent guild halls she had visited. Even stranger yet, the walls appeared to be constructed of stone despite the wooden exterior. Dismissing the construction confusion, Fargathena began wandering around the guild, approaching all of the members in order to find the leader of the hall until she came across an Argonian named Kudai. Upon being asked about the recommendation, she claims that she hasn't had any time to prepare anything conventional, as she's been busy with a certain situation concerning Ardeline, a local guild member. Apparently, she did not want to get directly involved to avoid embarrassing the girl for some unknown reason, but the dark elf Varan Vamori has been approaching her relentlessly on a daily basis, and apparently has escalated to theft of her mage's staff. Handing us a charm scroll, she insists that we do not bring the situation up to Ardeline herself. After finding and selling a few alchemical devices throughout the guild, Fargathena approaches Ardeline and she speaks about how she doesn't really enjoy talking with people much and seems to be a bit of an introvert. This is why Kudai has put her in charge of selling alchemy supplies, perhaps to force her to interface with more members of the community or guild to assist her in coming to terms with interpersonal relations on a fundamental level. After selling her everything that recently resided on the guild shelves, Fargathena honors Kudai's request and doesn't bring up the topic of the staff or Varen Vamori, but instead turns to seek him out. After several bribes and charms, Varen decides he feels comfortable enough to speak to Fargathena regarding the mage's staff. It turns out that he's flustered, and all he really wants is for her to care about him in the same way that he cares about her. But unfortunately, she doesn't seem to, and this is causing a bit of rage to build up within Varen. This came to a boiling point sometime recently, when he stopped her to explain how he felt, and she wouldn't even stop for a moment to speak with him, angering Varen to the point of deciding to curiously steal her staff. He declares that he was admittedly a bit ashamed of the fact afterwards but doesn't really know how to apologize or even give it back as it turns out he's pawned it off to a vendor in the Talos district of the Imperial City. Alerting Kudai to the news, she hands Fargathena a few more charm scrolls and tells her simply to resolve the situation, and though the next time she stepped foot in that city she had planned to be an accepted mage of the Arcane University, sometimes life has other plans, and so off she went without delay to the Imperial City. Fortunately, Breville is located relatively close to the Imperial City, it's a short walk, and it's not long after beginning a northward trajectory that she sees the white gold tower looming in the distance. After a relatively quick walk, Fargathena arrives at the Talos district and locates the home of Soros Arenum, the fellow to whom the staff was sold. It takes some bribery and some charming, but Soros agrees to sell the staff back to us for a price of 200 gold. Though Kudai didn't provide any gold for the purpose of this goal, Fargathena figures that 200 gold is a pretty reasonable sum to pay a mage guild recommendation and eats the cost. After a quick trip to the market district to peddle a few goods and see what the local shopkeepers had available, Fargathena heads directly back to Breville in order to turn in the mage's staff. Arriving close to sunset, she's happy to see the small wooden bridge into Breville as it indicates her lengthy travels for this task are reaching a conclusion. Entering the city gates, she heads back to the mage's guild to speak with Kudai. Kudai seems pleased that we have acquired the staff, but has no interest in hearing the details of how it might have been acquired. Whether that's because she doesn't want to reimburse Fargathena or for other reasons was not immediately clear. Kudai thanks her for the effort and states that she will soon write the coveted recommendation and offers to teach her a charm spell, though regrettably it was weaker than the one already known to her. Her business concluded, Fargathena headed back to the Silver Home on the Water to rest for the remainder of the evening, as after a night's rest it will be time to journey to the final destination, Leowin. Heading south from Breville, we are traveling along the Lower Nibin River heading to the delta in the south that borders and is sandwiched between both elsewhere and the Black Marsh. The land becomes much more forested and low-lying with a large fog bank settling over the land as she continues to the south. Passing various small farms in an inn, Fargathena finally sees the strong walls of Leowin appear from beneath a thick sheet of fog. 
Entering the town under the cover of the dense fog, it's difficult to make out exactly how large the city is, but the buildings appear well kept and the layout of the city seems spacious. The Mage's Guild of Leowen is a rather large building, perhaps one of the largest yet, sitting in the western portion of the city and featuring a yellow exterior, seemingly a common color choice in Leowen. Once inside the guild, Fargathina immediately sees an older elf sitting idly on a bench near the front door, and she approaches her to speak. Something seems not quite right about this character, DeGale. She speaks in a convoluted and almost prophetic manner, but does suggest that Fargathina should seek out Agatha. Moving on and speaking to a man named Kalthar, he suggests also that we should speak to Agatha if we need to actually get something done, further stating that he doesn't even know why DeGale is still around. Turning to Agatha, who has walked up during the intervening time, she tells us that DeGale experiences what they deem as visions, for lack of a better term. These visions have even been historically helpful, but lately they have become more problematic. The reason for this is that she formerly was in possession of a family heirloom of sorts, an amulet. This amulet somehow allowed DeGale to have some level of control over her visions, and without it instead of proper visions she received what could be best described as a chaotic set of voices or visions that has effectively crippled the formerly coveted mage. Agata asks us to speak to other members of the guild hall in order to determine if any of them have further information or have seen the amulet in question, while she continues to tend to DeGale. Turning back to Kalthar as he was still nearby, he explains that he heard DeGale was put in charge of the Leo and guild hall as a favor, as opposed to a position based on merit, and he seems quite unsettled with this choice. He also states that he has overheard Agata and DeGale speaking about the amulet, and in fact he's glad that it's gone. He hopes that with her amulet missing, she will be removed from her position as leader of the guild hall, being that he sees her as being unfit for the position. He further offers some information about the Gale's father, claiming he served the Empire for years, but doesn't even rest with a tombstone over his head. Certainly a rather strong opinion to hold, and it arouses Fargathina's suspicion, but she continues on through the guild to speak to other members about the matter. While the other members don't offer up a lot of compelling information, a Khajiit by the name of Sadrasa does say that he heard Kalthir speaking about it recently, and he seemed overly agitated and, in fact, almost happy about the news. Information in hand, Fargathina heads back to search for Agata to relay what she's learned in her short investigation. Agata isn't surprised that Kalthar overheard them speaking, but when Fargathina mentioned he was speaking about Degale's father, Agata seems shocked because they hadn't mentioned that topic when speaking. She suggests that if there is a connection between the stone and DeGale's father, she's not aware of it, and that we should ask DeGale personally, hopefully jogging her memory on the matter. She claims that she will start keeping a closer eye on Kalthar in the meantime. As Fargathina approaches DeGale, whom is sitting at a table nearby, she begins speaking before we can even ask her about her father. Though her statement is convoluted and vague, she mentions what sounds like a crypt built into an old fort, and somehow we intuitively determine that it must be near Leowin. Fargathina heads out of town and into the swamp in search of this mysterious Blue Tower Crypt. Heading east out of Leowin, the landscape remains low and forested. It's not long before she stumbles upon what appears to be a ruined tower or fort, and after fighting through a series of marauders both inside and out, she comes to a room that appears to be a makeshift crypt with various coffins throughout. After dispatching a few resident imps, Fargathina begins to search the coffins for any trace of a special amulet or stone, and finally discovers something called Manduin's Amulet, and retrieves it from the coffin. Turning around and heading towards the stairs, she's stunned to see the figure of Kalthar running down the stairs towards her. He says we can't leave with the amulet, and that he needs it right now. Apparently, he was well aware of what we were up to, and that we would be likely to find the amulet, and therefore he had to stop us. After demanding that we hand it over, he explains that he didn't plan to keep the amulet forever, he just wanted DeGale to be demoted and removed as guild leader, hopefully with an advancement in his future as a result, at which point he would have returned her amulet. After moaning about Fargathina getting in the way of his plans, he unsheathes the dagger and summons a conjured ally to attack. After a fierce battle, his corpse lies among the scattered coffins. It would seem that Agata did not keep such a close eye upon Kalthir after all, and now he has found his final resting place. Fargathina exits the old fort into a thundering rainstorm and makes haste back westward towards Leowin in order to return the stolen amulet to DeGale. Upon returning the amulet, DeGale seems able to communicate much more effectively and thanks us for our efforts. After stating that she will gladly provide a recommendation, she begins relaying what sounds like one of her visions. 
that it will be up to Fargathena to decide the fate of many, and that life and death will be altered by her hands. She concludes by stating that Fargathena's time has now come and that the Arcane University needs her. Raminus Polis awaits our arrival even now. Somewhat overwhelmed with the conclusion of this task, Fargathena heads swiftly to a nearby inn, the Three Sisters. The inn is well kept and quaint, operated by three Khajiit sisters from which the name of the establishment comes. Paying for her room and heading upstairs to it, Fargathena lays her head down upon the pillow as thoughts continue to swirl in her mind concerning the foreboding words of the gale as she drifts off to sleep. In the morning, she will make her way to the Imperial City the task of acquiring recommendations from each city behind her, and more prepared than ever for her goal of becoming a powerful and respected mage. She had come a long way from the barmaid in Old Ebonheart. Shortly after waking from an only partially restful sleep, Fargathena heads out of Leowin with goals of reaching the Imperial City, but is immediately flagged down by an armored fellow by the name of Larexus Calidus, asking for a moment of her time. He goes on to say that he's after a group of skooma dealers that have holed up in a place he calls the Greyland Settlement to the south of Leowin. Apparently he's been trying to get to them for quite some time, but every time they see him coming they recognize him and flee the area too quickly to be apprehended. He hopes that they won't recognize Fargathena so that she can get a bit closer before they escape. Seemingly he wants them assassinated as he asks for the ringleader's ring as proof that the matter has been dealt with appropriately. Heading southward along the road out of Leowin, the Greyland settlement comes into view quickly out of the fog cover, and Fargathena enters the building, expecting to have some level of communication with the dealers, but she is immediately attacked by two fully armored and armed men. After a brief confrontation and a lot of magic slinging, Fargathena emerges victorious over the two and grabs the trophy ring from the Dunmer's corpse, as well as a complete set of chainmail armor that she gladly equips, as it's an upgrade from her current outfit. Heading back to Larexus, she hands him the ring, and while he's excited that the task is complete, he hands over a paltry 20 gold. A bit ruffled, Fargathena heads off towards the Imperial City before she decides he too needs to join the pile of corpses in Greyland Settlement. Traveling north through the lowlands during the rain, she passes Breville and continues her trek towards the Imperial City. Not long after the colors of sunset begin to blanket the sky, she sees the iconic white gold tower appear over the hill, and knows her objective is close at hand. Making her way into the city proper as darkness begins to descend, she decides to stop by in an inn to rest up for the evening, and that she will start fresh in the morning at the university. Finding a location called the Tiber Septim Hotel, Fargathena heads inside and secures a bed from the innkeeper. On the way towards the stairs, she is approached by a red guard named Ruslan who asks for a favor. She turns back to face him to see what it is he's after. At first she believes this to be a well-dressed beggar as he asks for a coin but then he further elaborates that he was shaken down by a corrupt member of the town watch for all of his septums. Apparently he was shopping at Jensen's and the guard accused him of stealing, and even though the shopkeeper claimed he was innocent as well, the guard demanded Ruslan pay the fine or he would suffer a sentence in jail. It would seem that this guard is relatively well known in the district as many shopkeepers have had run-ins with the fellow and are too afraid to speak up about him. While Ruslan doesn't specifically ask us to do something about the corrupt guard, it is implied. Fargathena tucks this bit of info into the back of her mind for later investigations, as with the entry to the university looming and such an important immediate goal, it's hard to entertain ideas of distractions at the moment, especially after receiving such a paltry reward the last time she went out of her way to help someone. Perhaps tomorrow she will investigate this matter further, perhaps not. Heading upstairs, she rests her head on the pillow of the rented bed and sleeps without incident through the night. At the first crack of dawn, Fargathena jumps out of bed and heads toward the Arcane University, which is located on the southern portion of the island in which the Imperial City sits. Though she is well aware who she's after, she's having a hard time locating this Raminus Polis figure. She can't access much of the university as the doors are locked, so she loiters around for a while, figuring that he will show up. After waiting for some time, she re-enters the Archmage's lobby only to find what appears to be Raminus floating in the air. Perhaps he was practicing some of that forbidden levitation magic. Raminus seems well aware of who we are and states that he's received recommendations from all of the guild halls and that he's promoting Fargathena to Apprentice and gifts her with the robe of the Apprentice and asks that we take a moment to try it on before speaking as to what comes next. After donning the robe and examining her new attire for a moment, she reapproaches the floating Raminus. 
He begins to speak regarding our likely experiences with the halls, that they were likely uneven experiences that highlight both the potential and pitfalls of the Mage's Guild. Now, he says, she can engage in more meaningful tasks and continue with her advancement through the Guild, but before she begins that process, she must construct her very own Mage's Staff. Apparently, it is a custom that every mage carries a staff which is crafted and enchanted by the guild, though it is more so a symbol of status than necessarily a practical weapon. Perhaps this explains why the missing staff was so important to Kudai and Brevil. It would seem that there is a grove very close to the Imperial City in which the wood for these staves is acquired, and we are to go there and meet one of the two mages, Alet or Zarasha, whom will help us acquire the necessary material for our staff. Upon arrival at the Wellspring Cave, after just a short swim from the city, a corpse is immediately visible in the lower room, and a hooded figure dressed in black robes is seen standing above it. Before any words can be exchanged, the figure attacks Fargathena, and she is forced to defend herself. After a quick battle, the corpse is determined to be that of Zarasha, one of the guild members she was sent to meet. Fargathena decides to investigate further as to what could have happened here, and is met with yet more robed, hooded figures deeper into the cave. Upon finding the exit to the Wellspring Cave that leads to the Grove, Fargathena exits just in time to see yet another seeming guild member fall to their death at the hands of more of these mysterious figures. After fending them all off and examining the corpse, which was determined to be Alette, Fargathena finds a stone chest in the center of the island containing an unfinished mage's staff and quickly grabs it. Racing back to the university, she figures Romanus needs to hear of these developments immediately. Raminus is distraught at the deaths of his colleagues and states that necromancers have always been a problem, but have typically stayed far away from the guild and operated primarily in the shadows. Explaining that he must speak to the council regarding the matter immediately, he instructs us to continue to tend to the creation of our staff, and that a one Delmar located in the Chronasium can help us with the matter, and that we should see him right away. The Chironasium is located immediately outside of the lobby, and Delmar is quick to help us with the creation of the staff. Fargathena chooses a frost staff, as that's the element she's become the most familiar with over the course of her travels. Delmar says that it will take about a day for him to complete the enchantment, and that we are to return tomorrow to retrieve it. That accomplished, and with little else to do for the time being since Raminus is surely meeting with the Council of Mages, Fargathena decides to make her way to the mages' quarters and get some rest for the evening so that she may pick up her mages' staff in the morning. After a great night's sleep in the mage's quarters, Fargathena is awakened by two speakers nearby. Good morning. Hello. Racing down the stairs and heading towards the Chronasium, Delmar seems to have finished up the staff and has placed it in a rear cabinet, which she gladly picks up. It seems to do some decent frost damage, so this could be a lot more useful to equip than the Blade of Woe that the creepy fellow Lucian had gifted her the other night in Skingrad. After waiting around in the lobby for some hours for Raminus to show up, he lets Fargathena know that she has ascended to the rank of journeyman due to her efforts. While the council is still investigating the goings-on at Wellspring Cave, apparently there is more pressing matter of an overdue book borrowed from the library by the Count of Skingrad. She finds it a bit odd that Raminus reiterates the direction of the city in relation to the Imperial City considering the fact that she had to have gone to this city in order to receive the recommendation just days ago. Raminus states that the Count is a bit of a recluse and can be difficult to receive an audience with, but with some persistence and perhaps being associated with the guild will be enough, so off she goes. Arriving in Skingrad, Fargathena opts to stay outside of the city and climb the earthen ramp to Castle Skingrad. As she walks across the long, stone walkway towards the castle, she looks down toward the great chapel with memories of her knights aiding Glarthir with a shudder, before entering the looming castle gates in search of the steward. Inside, she finds a familiar figure, Mercator Hossidus, the same man who was observed by her to be meeting with Tautius Sextius when investigating the conspiracy that Glarthir commissioned her for. With some hesitation, she approaches the man to ask after the Count. Mercator says that while the Count is very much aware of her presence here, he's not interested in meeting with us, and that we should return in one day while he makes efforts to change his mind on the matter. After loitering around the castle grounds for almost a day, Fargathena decides it's probably been long enough and seeks out Mercator again, only to be told that exactly one day must pass before he will speak with us again. Resting a few more hours in the corner of the country hall, Mercator claims he has an update and that the Count has agreed to see us. Strangely, he states that he wishes to meet with us north of the Cursed Mine outside of town at around 2 a.m. 
While this bit is a little unusual, stranger things have happened, and she was told the fellow was a bit reclusive, so fair enough, she thought. Heading towards the pasture, Fargathena passes her time by practicing her magical skills until the appointed hour. At quite nearly 2 a.m., two hooded figures cloaked in black approach Fargathena, flanking Mercator on either side. Looking around in confusion, Fargathena walks toward Mercator to ask where the Count was, at which point Mercator explains that he has misled us, and that not only will the Count not be arriving at all, but he's not even aware of our presence and that he's here to kill us. As the fight begins and daggers are slashed while magic is cast, a well-dressed figure emerges out of the shadows to begin beating on the assailants. Once Mercator and the hooded figures are defeated, the well-dressed fellow approaches Fargathena. After berating us for being dumb enough to accept a meeting time and location such as this, he introduces himself to be the Count of Skingrad, Janus Hasseldor. Apparently, he harbored strong suspicions of Mercator's necromantic treachery, but was waiting for him to reveal further traitors in the court before making his move. In addition, he appears to be... a vampire. He further reveals that the Council has not been honest with us, and that if there was a book to recover, it wasn't the primary function of our visit. Rather, he suggests that we were sent here to spy on the Count, as the Council suspected he had allied with the necromancers. Dismissing this idea and telling us that he may have more serious work for us at a later time, he passes a message with us telling the Council to come in more overt manner without the pretenses next time they need something from him. After this, he turns away and walks off, leaving Fargathena alone in the pasture with three corpses. Her mind turns back toward Mercator and the meeting with Tautius she observed. Perhaps there was something to all of that with Glarthir, and she's been doing the right thing by eliminating necromancers without even knowing it. It would seem she has been fighting the good fight long before joining the guild proper. Perhaps it is her destiny. As de Gale seemed to indicate. Trekking back to the Imperial City overnight, she heads straight to bed so she can confront Raminus about the matter early in the morning. Raminus seems pleased that the Count saved our skin, but claims it was never the intention of the Council to send her in harm's way. Apparently there is a bit of truce between the two. The Council keeps the Count's vampiric secret in exchange, he periodically provides them with intelligence. However, some of the recent edicts from the Council have strained this alliance, and the Council was concerned that the Count may have flipped on them, though that doesn't appear to have been the case. He claims that the Council will no longer keep matters from us, and most certainly will not send us into another situation like this. Interestingly, the Count doesn't seem to hesitate to dispatch necromancers, and even consider them enemies, so that couldn't be the edict that he has problems with but that point is not further elaborated upon. Upon finishing that explanation, Raminus declares that our efforts have not gone unnoticed and that we have attained the rank of Evoker, handing us a spell drinker amulet. After receiving the promotion, Raminus states that he has a new task for Fargathena and that no necromancers are to be involved. Our new task, in an effort to get our mind off of the recent troubles, is to aid a mage by the name of Erlov Yerl, whom is overseeing an alien excavation site at a location called Vatican to the east. Before speaking with Erlov, however, Fargathena decides to attempt to make use of the coveted spellcrafting services offered at the university. Spellcrafting is an amazing feature, and one that, to me, is a core identity of the Elder Scrolls as a series. This is one of the reasons I was so devastated with its removal from Skyrim. The basic concept is that any effect that you're familiar with, or have learned a spell regarding, is available for you to choose from. Once an effect is chosen, such as Restore Health, players can then choose multiple options to tailor the spell to their spellcasting needs. Range determines the target of the spell. In other words, is it a self, touch, or target spell? Touch and target further allows for another range variable to be adjusted for area of effect spells. Magnitude determines the power of the spell, and duration indicates how long it will last. So you could make a healing spell that recovers 20 health for 10 seconds, or whatever it is you'd like. The flexibility of this system was always engaging to me as opposed to relying on set spells available at a vendor. The player could tailor their spellbook to their needs at any given skill level. Without it, something like Skyrim seems very empty in comparison in regard to magical capabilities, and I dearly hope that this system makes a return for the Elder Scrolls VI. When speaking with Erlav, he explains that he hasn't been able to give the excavation site the full attention it deserves as of late due to obligations with the Council. The last he heard, there was some problem of sort blocking further excavation or progress, and we are to travel to the excavation site and meet the mage heading up the on-site activities, Skalil to retrieve an update or lend any aid that we can. 
After handing us a key to access the site, he tells us that it is apparently just south of Chadenhall, so off we go. At first, it appears to just be a damp cave, but deeper within it turns to alien ruins. Shortly after this transition, we run into Skalil, who seems burnt out on the whole process. She explains that they have uncovered some sort of pillar that reacts to magic, even to the point of damaging casters attempting to unravel the secrets of it. She explains that her co-worker, Danell, is downstairs and has remained by the pillar effectively day and night, and she suspects that he's just going to get killed, and that we should ask him about anything he's learned. Upon finding Danell deeper into the ruin, he reiterates much of what Scalil has told us, but points out that there are inscriptions upon the wall, and that Scalil has a book which could help us decipher the inscriptions. Heading back upstairs to Scalil, she's happy to offer over the book. Danell wants us to read aloud the inscriptions upon the wall and ask him for translation from the book, at which point we determine that the four messages on the wall are Fire, Frost, Fortify Magicka, and Diminish Magicka. Casting fire upon the pillar yields some motion, so Fargathena tinkers with the four spells in different sequences for a short while before revealing the secret of the pillar with the correct casting order. Considering that these mages had everything at their disposal to solve this mystery, yet failed to do so for who knows how long, Fargathena doesn't think they should be the ones sent on any further excavations. The pillar opens to reveal a passage further into the ruins, and Danelle suggests that we should be the ones to investigate since we uncovered the secret of the pillar. So down we go. After avoiding various traps and dealing with successive enemy encounters, Fargathena makes her way to a large and central chamber. Upon the center pedestal is an ancient elven helm, which she takes and returns to Skalil to update her on the progress. Skalil suggests that we best take it back to Erlav right away so that he can further examine or investigate the artifact, so Fargathena heads back towards the Imperial City as the sun begins to set on Cyrodiil. Having traveled all night with this important discovery, Fargathena makes her way into the lobby to meet with Erlav. He effectively gives us a pat on the back and thanks us, claiming he will put in a good word with Raminus for us. Turning to Raminus, he congratulates us on our good work at Vatican and promotes Fargathena to the rank of Conjurer, giving her a brand new robe in the process. The robe is much more powerful than her previous attire, so she begins wearing it immediately, though this seems to be what most of the apprentices and members of the guild are wearing in their day-to-day -day activities, if the color is any indication. Before we can leave to get some rest, Raminus states that there is another predicament that he believes we can help to resolve if we are ready for it. Ready or not, Fargathena motions Raminus to go on. Raminus explains that the guild is seeking out more information from all avenues in order to combat the necromancer menace. Mentioning Falkar, the previous guild hall leader of Chadenhall, he speculates as to why he would have been in possession of a black soul gem. Apparently, these have been associated with other necromancers in the past, but the purpose is not clear, nor are they aware of what function they even perform. He explains that they have been overlooking these critical questions because they were so focused on rooting out the necromantic threat as quickly as possible. That in mind, he wants us to follow up on the Black Soul Gem with Tarmina at the Mystic Archives here on site at the University. He states that Tarmina is burning the midnight oil working day and night in the archives and can be found there presently. The way he makes it sound as if she's fervently working to resolve the situation, stating that she stops only to sleep at the Archmage's request so she heads off to the archives. Interestingly, if you listen to Raminus, he makes it sound like Tarmina is working furiously on her own accord to unravel the mystery of the necromancers, but upon arrival she makes it sound more like they are slave driving her to derive this information. Just an interesting observation that helps build the world, I think. Tarmina is a well-spoken Argonian in a room full of books, ancient tombs of knowledge on various subjects. She immediately explains that she's in the process of deeply researching necromancy, but is overwhelmed by all the requests concerning the matter. Asking her about the Black Soul Gems, she seems to recall a book that covered the matter called Necromancer's Moon, but she doesn't have the time to find it for us. Finding the book laying upon a table nearby, Fargathena examines the pages within and there seems to be a description of some sort of ritual that occurs based on celestial alignments or events, specifically something the book calls the Shade of the Revenant. Tarmina claims she isn't familiar with that term, but that we are welcome to borrow the book and seek out answers elsewhere. Taking the book back to Raminus, he also claims he isn't familiar with the Shade of the Revenant, but based on the text, he states that it sounds like some manner of celestial phenomenon, and that we should speak with Bothiel, who operates the Orrery. This proves to be a simple matter, as she's presently standing right next to Raminus, so Fargathena pivots to her and begins quizzing her about the Shade of the Revenant mentioned in the Necromancer's Moon text. 
She seems to recall that Falcar was here recently, asking after just such a thing. It would seem this fellow is far more important to the plot than the initial quest in Chadenhall would lead you to believe. While she wasn't able to help us, just as she wasn't able to help Falkar, she notes that he had a large amount of notes with him, and when he took his leave, he dropped one such note, and she handed it to Fargathena for examination. Upon reading the note, it appears to list locations of potential ritualistic sites. Ramana states that we should go to one of these locations, the Dark Fissure, which he notes is located near Chadenhall, and that we should seek out this celestial phenomenon and observe what happens there during such an event. Heading to the outskirts of Chadenhall and locating the site in question, there does appear to be some sort of altar set up on the mountainside. Setting up her camping supplies, Fargathena waits in a good position for a day or two to see if such a phenomenon occurs, and sure enough, around midnight, a pillar of light can be seen emanating from the heavens and targeting the pillar itself. Unsure what to make of this, she heads down to examine what's going on and is confronted by a black-robed figure. The figure shouts that she will not be able to stop them, and that the Order of the Black Worm will consume all in its path before attacking her. After subduing the attacker, Fargathena notices a handwritten note on the corpse and examines it. It appeared to be instructions pertaining to the ritual. Apparently the necromancers would place a Grand Soul Gem into the altar and strike it with a Soul Trap spell, and this would transform the Grand Soul Gem into a Black Soul Gem. Casually glancing at the altar, Fargathena observed a Grand Soul Gem already placed into the altar, so she decided to cast Soul Trap upon it. Surely enough, the Grand Soul Gem was transformed into a Black Soul Gem. Slipping it into her pocket, she started to make her way back to the Imperial City under the cover of night. There was no need for such a powerful item to go to waste, after all. After returning to the city and resting overnight, Fargathena finds Raminus in the lobby and explains what happened the previous night, excluding the acquisition of the Black Soul Gem, of course. He seems both pleased that we were able to observe the ritual and distressed that it wasn't just a rumor or a myth. Raminus fears that the rank of necromancers may be quite larger than initially expected or believed, and he seems concerned about this. He explains that he will take this information quickly to the Council, and simultaneously promotes Fargathena to the rank of Magician. So, with that done, Raminus claims that we will be taking our next task directly from the Archmage himself, Hannibal Traven. Heading up into the now accessible Archmage Tower Council Chambers, Fargathena seeks him out. Traven says he now has a more direct test for us and that it's long since been time that we have met face to face. He explains that their position has long since been to watch and observe the Necromancers to see what will unfold, but that the time for that has passed and they can no longer tolerate the direct attacks upon the Guild. He further reveals that most of their information about the Necromancers has been coming from an informant whom has penetrated the Necromancers' guild, and has been regularly sending back intel. Apparently this intel has stopped arriving and the infiltrator has gone radio silent, which is highly concerning to Traven. He further states that a group of battle mages have been dispatched already to the last known location of the informant, which were the Aeliad ruins of Nanyon Twill. Traven wishes for Fargathena to go to these ruins and meet up with the previously sent battle mages and recover the informant, bringing him safely back to the guild. I think this would have been an interesting option for Oblivion, to have the player be able to join the Necromancer's Guild as a sort of opposite side of the coin to the Mage's Guild. I don't think all that much work would have had to have been done either. The way I imagine it is that the player instead meets up with the Necromancer somehow and agrees to infiltrate the Mage's Guild, and many of the quests proceed in the same manner. Considering how the quest line ends, I think it could have been tinkered with to be done from the Necromancer's perspective without a lot of changes. While this would have mostly offered a difference more so in terms of flavor than a practical difference, I think it would have been an interesting option to include in the game. Immediately after walking into the ruins, Fargathena is met with a fellow by the name of Fifth Reggae, who introduces himself as a battle mage sent by the Council. He doesn't say it directly, but implies the other battle mages are all dead stating that the necromancers knew they were coming and seemingly set up an ambush. At least that's what Fargathena takes from it, leading to questions about a potential mole on the inside at the university, since it's exceedingly unlikely the informant would reveal himself and therefore put his own life in jeopardy. Fithrage says we should join forces, and that we could help each other to extract the informant, and begins to lead the way. But then... Yeah. Smashes so hard that he doesn't even leave a corpse. So that's the end of Fithrage. Farthagina shakes her head and moves forward into the dungeon, encountering various sorts of undead and necromancers until she encounters a Mariette Riel. 
Mariette tells us that the informant is in no condition to be leaving, as he has been turned into a worm thrall now. She further reveals their group is known as the Order of the Black Worm, and claims we shall not be leaving either before attacking. After defeating her and several other necromancers hanging about, we discover the informant, Macanius, hidden in a concealed room, and indeed it does appear that he takes the form of the undead now. Being able to do nothing further for him, Fargathena takes her leave of the ruins and heads back toward the Arcane University to alert Traven of the results of her failed attempt to rescue the informant and aid the battle mages. Traven can tell from our face that the news isn't great. After explaining the present condition of the informant, Traven seems unnerved but doesn't have a whole lot to say to us about the matter, instead sending us to visit Raminus for a promotion. Downstairs, Raminus promotes us to the rank of Warlock and states that our role in the guild has become more essential and that now we can freely access the council chamber. Fargathena is a bit confused about this access because that's the upstairs room she had to access in order to get the previous mission from Traven, since he doesn't ever seem to leave from there. But she shrugs it off and heads back upstairs to see if Traven has any new task for us to investigate. Traven states that they have received a missive from the Count of Skengrad for Fargathena personally to visit. While Traven seems confused about the very specific request, Fargathena isn't surprised due to her previous run-in with the Count. Traven states that he has information pertinent to the guild and he wants us to go immediately to retrieve said information. So off Fargothina goes towards Skingrad with haste. Upon arriving in Skingrad and meeting with the Count, he explains that he specifically requested Fargothina because he believes she can be trusted. However, he has a small nuisance, as he calls it, that he would like us to take care of before he's willing to provide the information. Apparently, a nest of vampires has taken up residence right outside the Skengrad city limits in a nearby location called Bloodcrust Cavern. Even worse, a group of vampire hunters have shown up in Skengrad. This presents a twofold problem for the Count. Firstly, he doesn't want the rogue vampires feeding on his citizens. That's his turf, after all. And secondly, he doesn't want the vampire hunters to get any wild ideas and begin to suspect his condition. Fargathena's job? Well, he wants us not only to eliminate the vampires, but also the vampire hunters, and further, to do so discreetly. He doesn't care how it's handled, just that it is. Though he does warn that if it's done too overtly, the guards would become involved, and he wouldn't be able to stay their interest as he doesn't want to be involved in this at all. This in mind, Fargathena has an idea. She heads to Skingrad and begins asking after these alleged vampire hunters, and one lead takes her to the Orc Run Two Sisters Lodge. After speaking with the innkeeper there, she lets on that they are staying here and often visit for the evening before heading to bed later on in the night. Knowledge in hand, Fargathena loiters in the inn for a while waiting for their arrival, and sure enough, they show up in the evening. Approaching them, she is directed towards their leader, Eridor. After speaking briefly to Eridor, she lets on that she heard the vampires are residing nearby in Bloodcrust Cave, at which point Eridor states that they will most certainly be headed that way sooner than later to eradicate this menace. Hoping for a bit of a two birds, one stone situation, Fargathena rests up and then makes her way to the cave. Upon entering, Fargathena observes someone being chased out of the cave by a vampire, so she assists in defeating the vampire and then speaks with the seeming human. He states that he's just doing his job and that we should speak to Eridor, which confirms he's with the vampire hunting group. Seeing that he's alone means this is an opportunity and Fargathena quickly dispatches the lone hunter and makes her way back into the cave. After entering, she realizes that the shapes at the base of the cave are bodies, and upon further investigation, it seems to be the entire group of vampire hunters. Unfortunately, they didn't seem to be very good at their job, since they didn't make it past the first room without being completely slaughtered, which is unfortunate, as she was hoping they would have taken out more of the vampires. Proceeding through the cave, Fargathena systematically kills the remaining vampires and heads back to meet the Count to let him know his task is complete. Being pleased with our work, he sees fit to relay the message. It turns out the message that the Count has for the guild is quite simple. Mana Marco has returned to Cyrodiil, and the necromancers are heeding his call. Apparently, he has established himself somewhere in northern Cyrodiil, but between that and his return is all the Count knows. We are to take this message back with great haste to Traven. While the name Mana Marco does not ring any bells for Fargathena in particular, he was featured in the previous Elder Scrolls game, Daggerfall, and is a returning character in this case. As Fargathena returns to the Arcane University, the weather is gloomy and the rain pours down as if to represent the nature of the news she bears for Traven. He seems concerned about the news but doesn't elaborate too much on the consequences of the information, but says that he needs to consult with the Council to determine how to proceed with the situation 
and doesn't have any more work for us at the moment. So Fargathena takes the time to get some rest and contemplate the recent events. Making her way through the campus with her hands shielding her from the torrential downpour, Fargathena heads toward the mage's quarters to get some shut-eye. After resting up for a while and tinkering some with the item enchanter, Fargathena decides it has probably been long enough and heads back to meet with Archmage Traven. He tells Fargathena that the council is in complete disarray with the news that Manamarco has come to Cyrodiil, and while it's obvious that he's targeted the guild, they have received no demands and cannot fathom why. Traven reiterates that all of his attention is focused upon the council at this time, and asks if we can assist with a small task that he has been avoiding due to lack of attention. After agreeing, Traven explains that it's been quite some time since he has heard from the Bruma Guildhall, run by Jean, and this is quite unusual for her. While he welcomes the break in correspondence, perhaps saying something about their relationship, he worries that something could be amiss, all things considered. Goal in mind, Fargathena sets off to Bruma to investigate the lack of communication. Immediately upon entering the Guildhall, Fargathena can see something is dreadfully wrong. The whole place is in disarray and engulfed in flames with skeletons wandering about, equipped with deadly elven and dwarven axes, with corpses of guild members littering the floor. Becoming quickly overwhelmed by the large number of skeletons in the guild, the battle spills out into the streets, where citizens of Bruma and the town guard become involved, though not without some casualties. Fargothina does appreciate that the citizens jumped in to help at their own risk as opposed to running away, however, especially the brave orc that died in short order. Upon clearing the skeletons and making it further into the guild hall, Fargothina comes across an extremely odd encounter. For some reason, halfway into the burning guild hall, a man named Tolgan is waiting there to talk to her on behalf of the Countess of Bruma. Apparently, she is wishing to solicit her for work, and he even offers her a small advance to whet Fargathena's appetite. Fargathena walks away from this encounter more confused than ever that a herald would seek her out amidst a burning building, but she pushes on towards the rear of the guild, the former guild leader's chambers. Once inside, she encounters Camilla, who declares that we've missed the party, but we won't be leaving, and attacks immediately. After defeating the opponent, our old friend Jaskar appears out of nowhere and relays the story of what happened. Apparently the King of Worms himself appeared and slayed each member of the guild save Jaskar, whom was quick enough to hide with an invisibility spell. Though he also mentions the King of Worms verbally expressed a location that he'd be going to, the Echo Cave, while looking right at the location Jaskar was standing, as if he had wanted him to relay the message. After explaining what happened, Jaskar says he's getting out immediately for fear they may return, and heads toward the Arcane University, where he hopes he will be safe. Information in hand, Fargothina heads the same way to alert Archmage Traven of the deadly happenings in Bruma. Shockingly, Traven states that he's going to need a few days to digest this information, which seems counterintuitive to events which appear to be moving at light speed now. Perhaps if he hadn't taken a couple of days after the events of the Aeliad Ruins, things wouldn't be in such bad shape presently, but Fargathena has little power over the Archmage and accepts his command to stand down for the moment. Heading back downstairs, she sees Jaskar as she goes to meet with Raminus and receive yet another advancement in rank. Raminus offers her a new multi-element spell and promotes her to the rank of Wizard. Left with little to do immediately, Fargathena heads back to the mage's quarters to rest and reflect upon the recent and tragic events, thoughts whirling through her mind incessantly, seeming to impact her very dreams. You dream of someone sleeping peacefully in his bed, when a shadowy, gaunt figure silently enters the room. Approaching the bed, the figure leans down and sinks its fangs into the sleeping person. After a few moments, the pale figure rises, blood dripping down her chin. As color flows back into the vampire's face, and her features fill out, you recognize the face as your own. You awake screaming. Waking up horrified, Fargathena shudders and considers this, hopefully to be nothing beyond a bad dream considering all of her recent run-ins with vampires, be it the Count or at the Cave. Heading to the central lobby, Fargathena sought out Archmage Traven. Traven says that the council is in complete ruins and a course of action could not be agreed upon, so they completely fractured. Suffice to say, he states that the council has shattered and artifacts have been lost. Apparently, two groups of mages have left the university. The first of which is a group led by Erlov Jarol, the leader of the excavation site Fargathena assisted with. Apparently, he has taken an item called the Bloodworm Helm and has retreated to Fort Telemann in the southeastern portion of Cyrodiil, near the Black Marsh. The second group was led by Karanya, another council member, and they had taken an item called the Necromancer's Amulet, 
claiming its continued presence in the university posed an active threat to the Imperial City. Traven doesn't inherently disagree with that sentiment, but he questions as to whether or not her motivations were genuine, as she seemed all too eager to explore its power. She has taken up occupancy in Fort Ontis in the northwestern region of Cyrodiil. Traven would like Fargathena to seek out and secure these two artifacts, and talk some sense into the council members, whom have gone rogue, effectively. Decidedly also eager to explore the potential power of these artifacts, Fargathena makes the decision to seek out Karanya in the northwestern portion of Cyrodiil first. Trekking through the hilly wilderness, she decides to take a short rest and experiences an even more disturbing dream. In your dream, you approach a vampire ancient. Having just completed a perilous task for him, you swell with pride, sure that he will now bestow even greater power upon you. The entire clan's eyes are upon you. Walking toward the dais where he stands, you realize that your task for him is actually unfinished, and that all of your vampiric powers have left you. You cry out as the clan descends upon you, and the ancient's fangs rip into the flesh of your throat. Awakening just as horrified as the last dream, Fargathena worries that there could be more to these ominous dreams. Picking herself up, she continues her trek to the fort. Strangely, she feels... faster. More agile than before. Surely it's nothing. Upon entering the fort, everything seems fairly normal. It would appear quite a few mages came with Karanya to the fort as Fargathena passes quite a few of them on the way deeper into the structure, each motioning her forward to find Karanya. Upon entering the room in which Karanya was occupying, things appeared to take a much darker turn. Altars with corpses strewn upon them, and giant containers filled with bones lined the walls, as well as a few banners featuring a skull. What could she be doing here, Fargathena could not explain as of yet, so she approached Karanya to find out what was going on. Initially, Karanya appears to think that we've come to join her, but Fargathena explains that she's here to bring the amulet back to the university. Karanya says that Fargathena is far over her head, and that she fully plans to gift the amulet to Manamarco, as well as our corpse, before attacking. This helps explain how the university's informant was outed. Karanya was a traitor, feeding information to Manamarco from within the university. After slaying Karanya, all the previous mages in the fort appear to don necromancer garb and are hostile, causing Fargathena to have to fight her way out to the surface. Unsettled with the recent events and not certain what to think, she pushes the considerations from her mind and heads towards the Black Marsh border in order to find Airlab, hoping that the encounter goes better than this one did. Arriving at Fort Telamon during the night, Fargathena enters the fort unsure what to expect. Within moments she's attacked by necromancers, so it seems as though Erlov is a traitor as well. Passing through the fort, eventually more of the same sort of sacrificial altars are found and seem to be additive evidence to this theory. At some point, the fort gives way to a cave-like structure. But further in, Fargathena finds a very large pit, and at the center of that pit appears to be the corpse of Irvin, and he seems to have the bloodworm helm upon his body. Picking this item up and leaving with more questions than answers, Fargathena heads out of the fort. It wasn't immediately clear as to whether or not he was in the process of being hunted down or if he came here with ill intent. Either way, he's dead now and perhaps we will never know completely. By the time Fargathena exits the fort, morning had come and the sun is shining brightly. In fact, it seems to be much brighter than ever before, and it even seems to burn ever so slightly. Confused and anxious, Fargathena quickly makes her way back to the Imperial City to return the artifacts to Archmage Traven with worries racing through her mind. Meeting with Traven, he seems shocked that Erlav is dead, but is relieved to have the helm back. While Traven seems to still act as though his rebellious activity was at least semi-justified, Fargathena is much less sure as to whether his actions were genuine or not. Karanya, on the other hand, we explain in full detail that she was a traitor without any reservation, and this seems to floor Archmage Traven, as she was one of his most trusted advisors. He thanks us for our efforts, and we exit from the Archmage's lobby for the time being, and we are approached by Raminus on the way down, at which point he says that he considers us an equal, and grants the rank of Master Wizard, which is the highest rank in the guild that can be bestowed upon one. Unsure of what to do, with events unfolding extremely fast, Fargathena heads back up to see Traven to figure out what the next plan of attack is. Apparently, he has learned of a super black soul gem, though he refuses to reveal his sources, citing only the Count of Skingrad as one of them. At this point, you can ask multiple questions about this quest, and I really like that. 
I would have liked to have seen that elsewhere in the quest line, or in general. It's sincerely lacking elsewhere, and in that regard stands out at this particular moment, but it's a nice touch. Fargothina asks why we would not simply seek to destroy the gem as opposed to gathering it, and Traven explains that he has immediate need of the gem and that it may be instrumental in saving the guild, offering an explanation forthcoming once she returns. Fargothina is somewhat suspicious that he wants it brought back instead of just destroyed, and while Fargothina has a lot of faith in Traven thus far, she is starting to become suspicious of his motives, as he appears to be very obsessed with the gem. Traven also states that he has sent a contingent of battle mages to the site in question and we are to meet them there. Further, Traven suggests that we are to oversee the actions on his behalf, and if the group is successful, Fargathena is to return immediately to the university. Due to the ever so present pain of the sun that continues to plague Fargathena, she takes a quick nap before heading toward the site. During her short rest, her dreams are yet again plagued. In your dream, you see a beautiful young woman holding an infant to her breast. It is only as you draw near that you realize the woman is a desiccated corpse and the child is purple and bloated, dying of plague. As mother and child crumble to dust, you awaken. Horrified by the nightmares that continue to plague her, she looks out the window and realizes night has fallen. It is time to head to the site without fear of the pestering sun. The site is familiar. Fargathena recalls observing the site much earlier in her journey, but didn't think much of it at the time. Just another alien ruin. Heading down the hill towards the site, she observes three battle mages outfitted in full plate mail waiting for her on the outskirts of the site. Upon speaking with them, they appear somewhat distressed that you are our only backup that Traven has sent them, but seem willing to move forward. Apparently, Traven has alerted them that Fargathena will be in charge of the entire operation, so after explaining the situation, they ask for your commands. Apparently, they tried to penetrate the structure already, but were fought back and lost a member of their group, and an enchantment was placed upon the door, making it impenetrable. At this point, they had concluded the best plan is to wait outside and ambush them once they finally exit the structure. Having chosen their locations based upon their abilities, Fargathena lies in wait with the group of battle mages until several necromancers appear to exit the structure and head towards them. Once they get close, the trap is sprung, and most of the necromancers are defeated with the exception of our old friend Falcar, who manages to escape into the structure. The battle mage plan is pretty cool in all honesty. It would have been interesting to see more things like this in the game, but it's somewhat unfortunate and feels a little half-baked in that they leave as soon as the exterior is done, telling the player to go inside alone effectively. They should have come in and helped you with the assault on the interior if they were still alive. Battling our way through the structure, Fargathena eventually comes face to face with Falkar and defeats him in magical combat, taking the colossal soul gem from his corpse. With no time to waste and not wishing again for the pain of the sun, Fargathena heads to the university immediately and with great haste to see Traven. Traven is exceedingly happy that we have returned the gem and states that he has need of it immediately. He states that we have much to speak of and very little time, and that a new task awaits us, but it is by far the most important that we have ever been entrusted with. Having precious little time to catch her breath, Fargathena immediately motions Traven to proceed. He states that he is well aware of the purpose for this special gem, and that it was meant to house his very own soul for Mana Marco to increase his power. She was tasked with retrieving the gem so that Mana Marco would not be able to use it. Traven believes that if he were to have acquired it, he would have immediately marched on the university and attacked. According to Traven, with the gem in Fargathena's possession, she will be impervious to his attempts to enthrall her, and when he fails at that, she is to strike him down. He further states that he has full confidence in her and that he is leaving the entire guild in her care. When he is gone, she will be recognized as the Archmage. After he states this, he bids her farewell. Fargothina is floored at this latest revelation and the implications, but before she can think it over too much or ask further questions of Traven, staring shocked at the scene before her, Fargothina isn't sure what to make of it. She slowly walks over to examine his corpse to find he must have soul trapped himself, as the colossal soul gem resides on his person and is quite filled. Horrified, she takes the gem and his other belongings, as there's no use letting them go to waste, and heads downstairs to quickly exit the university without a word to another soul. Heading toward Bruma, she decides to rest for the evening before heading to the Echo Cave, as she's become quite unfond of the sun in recent days. Stopping by at the Gerald View Inn, she rests until the sun is mostly hidden over the horizon, but not restfully. In your dream, an old wise woman treats you for burns on your hands. As she applies a salve to your skin, you feel the tingle of magic as the pain begins to subside. 
But as you watch, the flesh of your hands begins to bubble, crack and split, falling in chunks to the floor of her hut. As the wise woman smiles, you wake up. Alarmed with the persistent dreams, Fargathena makes her way out of the inn, only to find that even at this late hour, the sun still plagues her skin, but she feels ever stronger, ever faster, and her abilities with the magic arts seem to come much easier than before. Glancing in a glass window on the way out of Bruma, she is frightened at the state of her face. Her skin is wrinkled and pale. The reality is becoming clear to her. With all of her run-ins with vampires, it would appear that she has contracted the disease. Unsure how to feel about the reality of this, she focuses on what she can use for now. She's stronger, more powerful than ever, and it's a fitting time to feel empowered as she makes her way to the Echo Cave to face Mana Marco. Perhaps fate shines upon her this day, in this hour. Arriving at Echo Cave, just as water begins to pour out of the sky heavily, she observes a lone sentry standing outside of the door who approaches her immediately. He states that he alone holds the key to the door of the cave and that he will die defending it. Fargathena rips through him, little care left for those who would stand in her way, and enters the cave. After long halls filled with necromancers and undead, Fargathena makes her way to what appears to be a sort of centralized ritual chamber and sees a lone figure standing in the middle, seemingly waiting for her arrival. Upon entering, a cage of bone appears to thrust from the ground in all directions, locking her into a small arena with the figure, and he seems to cast a sort of paralyzed spell as her muscles become rigid while he approaches her. It's Mana Marco. He explains that while he expected Archmage Traven to come himself, and not the star or pupil as he calls her, she will do just as well, as the fact that she has made it this far illustrates her power. He explains further his plan to turn Fargothina into an undead thrall and capture her soul in order to study both. That said, he begins his attack and she suddenly recovers use of her muscles. After a long battle within the arena, dodging undead and slinging spells back and forth, Mana Marco falls in battle. Fargothina stands above his corpse with a grim satisfaction taking both his robes and his coveted staff of worms, which holds the power of reanimation within. Jumping into the nearby water, she swims out of the area, makes her way out of the cave, and heads back to the university to explain to everyone what has transpired. Raminus approaches Fargothina as soon as he sees her, and seems to be calling her the Archmage. Fargothina explains that Manamarco has been defeated, and that the King of Worms is no more. Raminus replies that he received a note from Traven explaining the happenings of the recent hours, and understands that we are to be his replacement. While he surely must make time to mourn at a different hour, for now he is excited that the province-wide threat has ended and will be sending out notifications to all guild halls that there is a new Archmage present at the university. Heading upstairs to the chamber which she's never entered, the Archmage's chamber, she glances around the room in contemplation of all that has been lost in this fierce battle for Cyrodiil and her new place among what remains. She had come a long way from a barmaid in Old Evanhart, daughter of an unremarkable elf with nothing but dreams of becoming an accepted mage. Now she was the Archmage. Indeed, a highly powerful and vampiric Archmage at that. Whether she would seek to cleanse herself of vampirism or not is a consideration for another day, as for now she felt she deserved some rest while matters settled down. Slumping into the bed that was now hers, she found her hand drawn to her pocket only to find the very amulet she was given what felt like so long ago. The Amulet of Kings. She stared at her pale image reflected strongly in the gigantic gem of ruby, and wondered what her future held. And that's... Oblivion's Mage Guild questline. It has been many years since I've last completed this questline, possibly over a decade, which is one of the reasons I chose to play it. Over the last few years I've revisited most of the Elder Scrolls games, and while I did revisit Oblivion, I only did some questing, like the Dark Brotherhood, but not much else. Having recently completed the College of Winterhold in Skyrim, I thought this would be an interesting time to see how Oblivion compared directly and began working on this project, and a long project it has been. This story ballooned out much farther than I had anticipated and took much more work than I anticipated. So for those of you that made it this far, I hope you enjoyed it. Oblivion is still a good game to this day, warts and all. The game played very well with little in the way of problems in terms of bugs or issues despite being unmodded vanilla. While there are some issues that really stick out to me, like the atrocious level scaling that is so heavy-handed, it is the last game with some of what I consider to be the core and fundamental features of an Elder Scrolls game, such as core statistics, both the athletics and acrobatics skill, as well as more traditional enchantment mechanisms and spellcrafting. 
I firmly believe that Skyrim shed too much of the Elder Scrolls DNA in its mad quest for streamlining and mass appeal, though arguably they received the mass appeal they were looking for, but at what cost? I really hope that some of these features return for an eventual Elder Scrolls 6 in 2040. Leveling isn't as bad as some would say. In other words, some would tell you that you absolutely have to min-max your character to get to the coveted plus 5 in each desired stat per level up, but I really don't think the game was intended to be played like that, and I certainly don't believe it needs to be played like that to enjoy it. Obviously, if that's your thing, feel free to have a blast, but you don't need 100 in each of your core stats to enjoy the game. While I did encounter a couple of troubles here and there, this character ended with very low endurance and strength, but the magic more than made up for it in the end, and I never reached 100 in any stat, even with the enchanted items. Either way, that's the good thing about the Elder Scrolls, and always has been. You play it how you want to. I had also never played a pure mage character in this particular game before, and for the most part I enjoyed it. What compelled me to do this was recently playing through Skyrim with a pure mage. I think if I were to do it again, I would be a lot better at it, and maybe I will one day. Now my thoughts turn to Morrowind, in which magic is even more powerful, though I have also likewise never played a pure mage in that game. I hope you enjoyed the video and the tale of Fargothina, descendant of Fargoth. If you did, please take the time to like the video, and if you have any comments regarding the story presented, Oblivion, or Elder Scrolls in general, feel free to leave a comment below and let's discuss it. As always, you are welcome to subscribe to the channel for potentially more videos of this nature, and of course much more. Subscribing while on this video in particular tells me that you really liked this content specifically, and it helps me determine what sort of videos to make in the future. Until next we meet in the vast world of Tamriel.